Enjoy the taste of summer no matter what the weather when you head to Maverick for some Mountain Dew Baja Blast. You'll love the legendary, refreshing tropical lime flavor. And to make the sweetness last longer, Maverick now has it in one liter bottles. For a limited time, get two for five bucks, single purchase, regular price. Plus, Adventure Club members get 25 bonus trail points with purchase. So blast into Maverick today and enjoy that unmistakable Baja flavor. Maverick, Adventure's first stop. State Farm and DJ Dramos from Life as a Gringo know making smarter financial moves today secures a financial freedom for a successful tomorrow. Now we have a level of privilege that our parents never had. So what do we do with it, right? How do, we, how do we utilize the opportunities that we have that they don't, right? And a lot of that is educating ourselves, educating ourselves on how to not make the same mistakes they did. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. State Farm, proud sponsor of My Cultura Podcast Network. Exciting news, Wine Coven. As you know, we are doing a live show at the Fitzgerald Theater in St. Paul on Saturday, September 21st. But if you aren't local... We have even more exciting news for you. Yes, we do. For the first time in Wine and Crime history, we will be live streaming the show directly from the theater to give all of you who can't attend in person a true live show experience. It's like Wine and Crime pay-per-view fight night, baby. Yeah, but fortunately, it's not like Smell-O-Vision. No. No. And we won't actually be fighting. Well... You never know. You know us. Yeah, it's true. This will be a wild and witchy time with a feral girl theme, and we're working on some masterful, hot topic inspired costumes. Oh my God. I'm so excited about my costume. But actually, very inspired by the craft. We encourage you to dress up too. Lots of eyeliner. Yep. Whether you're in person or at home, please dress up and share your photos on the social medias. Uh, I will tell you, in-person tickets are selling fast, so don't miss your chance to come be with us in person at The Fitz, and you can head to wineandcrimepodcast.com for links to both in-person tickets and live stream tickets, and your live stream purchase also comes with, like, infinite replays, so you can experience the joy over and over again, or simply watch it in a time zone that is reasonable for you if you're, say, across the bog. Mm-hmm. We cannot wait to be back at the Fitzgerald and see all of you on September 21st. Woo! Wine and Crime contains graphic and explicit content which may not be suitable for some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. are listening to Wine and Crime, the podcast where two friends chug wine, chat true crime, and unleash their worst Minnesotan accents. Yes. Yes, we do. We do. I am Amanda. I am Lucy. And we, I got off to a rocky start (laughs) because I took a hit off of a pipe I packed the other day and the weed got real stale and it tasted awful and my mouth filled with wa- like saliva. Ugh. Oh, there goes Beans climbing on Blanche's cage to torture him. Did you suck any of the chunks into your mouth? I did get a chunk. Uh, and so w- that delayed recording by about 10 minutes because I had to go like flush my mouth out <laughs> and start eating mints. <laughs> but I'm back. And at least I did get a hit off of it. My Benjamin battery is fucking dead. You know, I've... this one's almost empty. Oh, God. I ripped a pump site off today. What does that mean? Y'all, this is, let me give you a peek behind the curtain as a pump wearing diabetic. Okay. It is so annoying. <laughs> uh, yeah. To have, <laughs> yeah. To have a pump with tubes. And I love my pump. It has been absolutely life changing to be on this tandem closed loop system but the tubes i went to pick something up from a friend's house earlier today and it got caught on like the little latch in the car door that like the car door clicks into oh no and it almost ripped it off but i felt it and i was like whoa this is a new site i don't want to i don't want to ruin this and then i was getting ready to record and it ripped off on the bathroom doorknob Jesus Christ. And I just changed my pump like yesterday. So it was a fresh site already. And I'm getting close to having to 
I'm like super close to needing to get a new box of supplies and they're like a grillion dollars. So it's just like, mm. it, it, you feel it pull and it's like watching it in slow motion. You're like, no. And then it's already, it's already coming off. So it's is like, that fuck! just, is that just the sticky patch or is that like a fucking yeah, it's a sticky port patch that site. has a, it's the sticky patch that has like a little cannula port in it. And then you could disconnect your tubing from it. And then I had to just put on another side patch and reconnect my tubing. I mean, it takes two seconds to fix. It's just like each one of those fuckers costs like 20 bucks. Oh, God. It's like, God damn it. Yeah, that <laughs> it sucks. Just, it hurts to see that just rip off after a day of use. Why were your tubes flying all over, all over God's green earth today? Well, because I forgot to It's see. It's my fault. At the end of the day, because oh, I'm I sure. usually, you know, everything usually is. <laughs> I usually tuck it into my bra for this exact reason, so I can have all my tubing under my clothes, so they're not just loose. Mm -hmm. But I was kind of like running, and mm -hmm. I just stuck my pump in my pocket. Oh, and so I, I had loose tubing. Also, it's super laundry day, so I'm in <laughs> this very ridiculous outfit that, like, I would wear even if it wasn't laundry day. I like I love your it. outfit. Thank you. It's a very 90s vibe that I have going right now. Mm -hmm. But my undergarments are ludicrous. <laughs> what are they? I am wearing tissue like, thin. Oh, tissue. Th like I'm wearing sex underwear. <laughs> like almost penetrable sex underwear. Jesus. Yeah. Is it so, edible? <laughs> it's not edible, but like, honestly. One step up it would be safe to eat. Like, it wouldn't be eat hard to pass. Like, you could easily digest this. Okay. So I have to do laundry after this. Anyway, that's my update on how my day's been going. So, there have been better days. It's honestly still a pretty good day. Yeah. I, like, don't have bad depression symptoms today, and I got a great night's sleep, so I'm like... I'm still, I mean, thank God if all these annoying things are going to happen on a day, mm -hmm. have it be a day where serotonin is like actually flowing yeah. and I'm happy to see you and be here. Oh, I'm excited for this recording today. Yeah, we have a very special fan pick from one of our Hog Girl Summer winners, mm -hmm. Denise Average, but you're far from average. You're well above average. You are so <laughs> above average, Denise, and they have picked the topic of Scranton crimes. We've already done Pennsylvania crimes. We have, but not specific to Scranton. No. And I also scrambled to get this uploaded into our Riverside today. <laughs> So we can talk about Scranton Crimes! I don't want to get sued, so I'm going to fade this out. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually fucking hate that song because I've watched so many episodes of The Office. You know the beef I have with it hmm. is that the cold open audio is like really nicely balanced and then it hard cuts to the theme song yep. and it is blasting you out of your chair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why do they do that? I don't know. There's something about that song which to me these days is so fucking abrasive. I skip it every time. I, I can't. Too. If I if I make it past the just the little piano part, I'm like clawing my eyes da -da 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 -da. out. Yeah. Yep. Can't do it. Yeah. It's, Once the it's, like, what is that even like a harmonica kicks in? Absolutely oh, not. I... Mm -hmm. No, no. I, I, th I think I have such a negative association with it now because I've fallen asleep to that show so many times and that blasting <laughs> totally. horn or whatever the fuck that is <laughs> has woken me from a deep sleep, like sweating and in fear, like I'm being attacked. Yep. Mm hmm. Sheer panic. I wonder how many other people who have watched so many episodes of The Office have the exact same reaction specifically to that theme song. I know it's a lot because I'm on the office subreddit. Oh, okay. For the memes, baby. Mm. And uh people feel very similarly. Okay. That and and are also pissed that the song is so fucking loud, like shockingly loud. It's shockingly loud. It's like it's a little too long. 
Yeah. Whenever I hear it start, I'm just like, no, 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 no. Finding the yep. clicker. Please, God, skip it, skip it. It's a very, if, if you're not a vape person and you've never screeched, where the fuck is my vape? But you have <laughs> panicked, fumbled for your remote to skip the office theme because you don't want to experience it. Mm-hmm. It's, the, it's the same it's the same line in a different font. It's exactly the same. It's feeling. like a rage. Yes. Mm. An instant rage. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, Scranton Crimes, baby. <laughs> We're doing it. We're doing it. And we will be coming back to the office, obviously. Uh, yeah, I am sure we will. But before we do, I want to recommend I was looking into wineries in the Scranton area mm. and Lackawanna County, baby. Y'all have some good options. The terroir is interesting. I have been to Scranton. I officiated a wedding up there. It's actually the scene of where I went to see Are You There, God? It's me, Margaret, (laughs) by myself, really high and out of like a panic attack. And you called me and you're like, I'm the only adult in this theater. Should I feel There was a cop outside. Well... I was like, this is not safe. They know <laughs> I'm going to get a, I'm a predator. Didn't you walk there because your motel was right next door or something? I didn't walk there, but there was a Dairy Queen right next to my motel. And mm. I did walk there mm-hmm. and informed you of that. No, I timed my gummy. I took it like right before getting in the car and I had like a 15 minute drive. So my high was setting in when I parked. Mm hmm. And it was I when just had, you it saw was, the cop when I saw the cop <laughs> and I just I panicked. And the only people I needed to reach out to were you and my husband. <laughs> the sight of a police officer, a law enforcement officer often does trigger the setting in of a weed gummy. <laughs> and Pennsylvania is also not a legal state. So I was like, I could get in trouble here. This could be yeah. bad. But you know what? It was fine. I didn't predator any children. I had a normal night. And the movie wasn't bad. The movie was lovely. So I wanted to shout out a, you know, an area winery. It's not in Scranton, but like we can't always get what we want. Okay. It's called Cellar Beast, B-E-A-S-T. And I am obsessed. Their branding is stellar. The winery looks gorgeous. Mm. I'd get Um, married at the Cellar Beast. I totally would, too. They do all these cool tastings and events. You can get married there. You know, it's it's uh, it's pretty fun. So they were established. They're new. They were established in 2021 in Andreas, Pennsylvania. And Cellar Beast proudly stands as a woman and veteran owned winery. The business was born from an unexpected bond between passionate winemakers and entrepreneurial wine enthusiasts. And together, Cellar Beast has carved out a unique spot in the world of wine driven by a commitment to traditional quality and unparalleled passion. And I got to say, looking at their selection, they have some beautiful looking wines. Like a couple of the ones that caught my eye, um, they have a Cab Franc Rosé that looks exceptional. Mm. Like it's this beautiful pale pink. It just, I, it's, it's. It, if it looks half as good as it, or if it tastes half as good as it looks, I would be over the fucking moon. I definitely want to order some of this. But they have a huge selection. They carry a ton of classic wines. They have Chardonnays. They have Gewürztraminer. They have a uh, beautiful red blends, Cab Franc, Sauvignon um, Blanc, Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Gris, Pinot Noir. Like a lot of the old standbys. But then they also have some really fun ones. Like they have a Carmenere, which I would love to try um, one of their wines. They call the Grand Melange, and it's a, a red wine blend that has some really fun ones in there. But the one specifically that I wanted to highlight today, mostly because I'm sure, as always happens, we're going to have some dark shit to talk about today. <laughs> and the label on this wine is so beautiful. It's also marked as an award winner. It is the 2021 Dark Angel Red. Ooh, I've got a Dark Angel in my case. I bet you do. (laughs) The Dark Angel is their flagship red. It's sourced from a single vineyard in the heart of Yakima, Yakima, Yakima Yakima Valley, Washington. I should know that. 
um, at the Ponton del Rosa Vineyard. So something fun about Cellar Beast, they do grow some of their own grapes, but then they are also like they focus so much on wine making and not so much the full farm to table experience, which I actually kind of appreciate because it can be hard to make these classics, to grow them in viticultural areas like the nor- northeast of the country. It's very cold there. A lot of these grapes are just not hardy enough to withstand those kinds of temperatures. And so you really can't make, you know, a Carmenier or like a, or a Cab Franc. It's harder to grow in that area. So they're sourcing these wines from other vineyards in the U.S., and kind of partnering with other places that can grow it better. And then they're putting their own spin on it by doing the actual wine making, fermentation, everything in house, mm. which I think is such a cool approach. That probably has, I mean, like percentage wise, what do you think has more effect? Well, obviously the varietal would have the most effect on the flavor. Mm-hmm. But the pro- but the processing and the stuff that happens after you harvest the grapes is yeah, pretty important I would say- too. Of of utmost importance, uh, the varietal is going dis- to determine uh, the majority of the flavor profile, but then the aging, like how they're doing the aging is going to have the second highest impact because if they're aging, you know, on French oak or if they're aging in stainless steel or concrete like that. The aging process after the initial fermentation affects the flavor of the wine so much before it goes into the bottle. So they still get a lot of agency over how they want the final product to taste just using the baseline flavor profile of grapes that they can access from other places in the country. So I think it's a super cool concept. You're still getting this locally made wine. Mm -hmm. The grapes just weren't necessarily all grown locally, which like, you know, there are benefits to both. I think it's cool. Yeah. Um, This specific bottle is 94% Carmenier and 6% Petit Verdot. It was aged for 16 months in 20% new French oak. And 80% neutral French oak. So that's going to showcase, they, they're they saying, it's showcasing the quality of this gorgeous fruit. New French oak is going to have a stronger flavor profile effect. So they're using less of that and then doing 80% of the neutral, which is like aged a little to get some of that like really strong, woody, oaky element Mm -hmm. it kind of fades from the wood over time just like anything else that has a scent it's just going to kind of fade out Mm -hmm. with the years so this is a cool you know peek into how they're making this wine again they're not growing the grapes but they're getting creative with how they age these after fermentation to achieve a really special flavor profile that's unique to cellar based and i just think that's so fucking cool it's unique This one is 13.7% ABV. It is a popper. It kind of looks like everything that they offer is corked and not capped. So you, well, except for their sparkling. The Blanc Noir is, is, you could just pull that bad boy. I was looking at that Blanc Noir. Isn't Mm. it gorgy? It's so pretty. It's like a really light looking rosé, but I clicked on it. It's sparkling. It's champagne style. I don't know who the fuck is doing their graphic design Branding. but like it's really good i mean i love seeing <laughs> graphic design on bottles from all ends of the spectrum and some smaller wineries just don't have the access <laughs> the budget to an in-house <laughs> incredible artist but like all these labels are incredible the june bit looks so cool mm-hmm. i want to try all of these wines i know they do tastings they have a wine club I feel like I Lisa highly, Vanderpump would approve of these wines. Yes, this feels very Vanderpump approved. Whoever has built their website, done their branding, you, y'all are crushing it. And we are very interested in hanging out with you and maybe paying your winery a visit. Hell yeah. But if you are interested in checking them out, go to sellerbeastwine.com. That's C-E-L-L-A-R-B-E-A-S-T wine.com. Check out their beautiful profile. You can schedule visits. They do guided tastings. You can do events there. They host private events. They just It just seems like they're really going for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, I, you know, as you know, I just I got high before this because it's like noon and I cannot <laughs> put away a bunch of red wine right now. And also I wanted to feature 
a winery that unfortunately I'm not able to access. But Lucy, are you sipping on anything today? I sure am because we're recording a drunk dive after this and <sighs> Corey's picking up June. So God damn right. I'm day drinking and I found this at the liquor store. It's called Punch Out. Ooh. Vodka smoothie. Speaking oh, of good branding. Cute. Yeah, that's adorable. And this is the Coco Cabana blend, which is pineapple, cherry, and citrus. I don't that's... know what to expect. Vodka smoothie kind of scared me, but I need you to taste that right now. Would you like to crack it for us? I'm gonna crack it. Okay. Here we go. Oh. Ooh, that was like beyond a nice crack that was like commercial crack yeah and here's my commercial pour oh it looks tasty yeah it looks like a beer but it doesn't smell like one chug 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 okay that's fucking good is it smoothie in this sort of like creamy way? Like where does the smoothie aspect come in? It's you think? translucent, but it does but taste a little bit thicker. Okay. It does look like it looks like a pale ale. Yeah. It kind of has that same mouthfeel, but it's like Ooh. sweet and tart from the pineapple. Mother. This is good. I got three more in the fridge. <laughs> that a girl. All right, well, I might have to go to the liquor store after this because that sounds pretty yeah. fucking good. So I think the brand is called Untitled Art, but this is called Punch Out. Cute. Yeah. All right. I'm going to look up if that is available locally. And while I'm doing that, should we take a quick break to hear a word from our sponsors? You know, I think we should. I think we should, too. Have you made the switch to NYX? Millions of women have made the switch to the revolutionary period underwear from NYX. That's K-N-I-X. Period panties from NYX are like no other, making them the number one leak-proof underwear brand in North America. They're comfy, stylish, and absorbent, perfect for period protection from your lightest to your heaviest days. They look, feel, and machine wash just like regular underwear, but feature incognito protection that has you covered. You can shop sizes from extra small to 4XL. Choose from all kinds of colors, prints, and different styles, from bikinis to boy shorts, thongs to high-rise. You've got to try NYX. See why millions are ditching disposable, wasteful period products and have switched to NYX. Go to knix.com and get 15% off with promo code TRY15. That's Nix.com promo code TRY15 for 15% off life-changing period underwear. That's K-N-I-X.com. You all know we're into our hair care products around mm. here, especially hair care products that smell delicious. Oh, yeah. So we are happy to accept sponsorship for this episode from Lola V, which is an award-winning hair care line founded by Jennifer Aniston. Ever heard of her? Oh, Yes. Yeah. My hair, it's, it's, get, it's seen it's it's seen some stuff. Mm -hmm. So whether it's like frequent coloring, heat styling, stress, aging, the mm -hmm. sun. Oh, God. Pollution. Mm -hmm. Like it, it's incessant damage to your hair. Mm -hmm. And our good pal Jen was like, why should I choose between using hair products that work or those and those that are genuinely like beneficial, those mm -hmm. that smell good. So she combined everything because she is magical. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's that's where Lola V comes from. So our pal Jen worked with industry leading chemists to develop a proprietary bond technology known as Biomimetic Peptide Pro 3. Mm. Cats and wigs. Yep. B Pro 3. So the Lola V lineup could deliver on both naturally derived ingredients and high performing results. Mm -hmm. So these are derived from chia seeds. The technology constructs a new protective cuticle around the hair where mm. damage begins to keep it healthy and looking its best. So it's like an all around defense against signs of aging and damage on the hair. So Ooh. if you want to try this, just go to LolaV.com and use code GALS15 at checkout. That gives you an exclusive 15% off your entire order. I love these Lola V products. My absolute favorite is the detangling and like shining hair mist. You love that. I'm obsessed with it. It smells so good. It leaves my hair silky smooth and it's just so much easier. My hair is very fine, so it tangles really easily after towel drying. 
This is helping me so much with avoiding breakage and just being able to easily get my brush through my hair when I'm drying. I, in the summer, I spend a decent amount of time outdoors. Good for and you. I'm in the sun. I'm hanging out in my hammock chair. I'm not necessarily like, you know, exercising my body, but my hair is very <laughs> much exposed to the sun. And the intensive repair treatment is clinically proven to repair and rebuild not just one, but all three types of bonds found in hair for truly stronger hair from the inside out. The ultimate hair savior for all seasons, especially summer. But like, maybe I'm going to be changing up having my hair in the sun, which very much affects my color and all of that. But then it's going to be winter soon and it's going to be dry mm -hmm. and my hair can get so brittle. Like you want this stuff for every season. It has your back, baby. Check out all Lola V products at your local Ulta Beauty location to experience the luxurious scent for yourself or head directly to their website at lolav.com. As our loyal listeners, you'll get an exclusive 15% off your entire order when you use code GALS15 at checkout. That's 15% off your order at L-O-L-A-V-I-E dot com with promo code GALS15. Please note you can only use one promo code per order and discounts can't be combined. After you purchase, they'll ask where you heard about them. Please support our show and tell them we sent you and your hair is going to thank you. It can be so hard to find a therapist, meet with them anytime outside of your house, and have it work out to be the right fit. Yeah. Which, like, with in-person therapy, this is something that drives me so nutty about this. It, it Because it can take so long to get an appointment and then a follow-up appointment, you might not know that your therapist isn't the right fit until you've been talking to them for months. Mm-hmm. But Talkspace is so much more accessible. It's very personalized. It's right from the comfort of your phone. And you can talk to your therapist like multiple times throughout the day, really get to know them. You can text your therapist anytime. You can call, you can do voice memos. It is just like such a great way to connect right away, not have to wait months. And you know what? If it's not working out for you, it's also way easier to get a new therapist with Talkspace. They thought of absolutely everything talkspace the leading virtual therapy provider makes getting the help you need easy accessible and not to mention affordable uh very affordable talkspace therapy and psychiatry are covered by many insurance plans and employers most insured members have a zero dollar copay mm -hmm. and it's just remarkably easy you just sign up online you get paired with a licensed provider that is the right fit for your needs as amanda said and if they're not Shake it up. Find a different one. Yep. No biggie. They typically match you within 48 hours, which is crucial. Yep. And if you do want to switch providers, it doesn't cost you anything. Mm -hmm. Talkspace provides personalized treatment for individuals, couples, the LGBTQIA plus community, veterans, teens, mm -hmm. like whoever you are, whatever you're going through, there are uh, there is a therapist that is perfect for you. And as a listener of this podcast, you will get $80 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash gals and enter promo code SPACE80 to match with a licensed therapist today. Go to Talkspace.com slash gals and enter promo code SPACE80, that's S-P-A-C-E-8-0, to get $80 off your first month and show your support for the show. That's Talkspace.com slash gals, promo code SPACE80. 80. Welcome back to the show that you never left. There was shit. just an ad. Oh, God. Lucy's gonna. <laughs> Lucy's like a mom on the prowl right now. She's like, it's been so long since I had the taste <laughs> of alcohol since on my, my mouth. lips have been wet. Moistened by the sweet, succulent taste of the booze, the vodka smoothie. <laughs> the vodka smoothie. The vodka smoothie. <laughs> well, while you're sipping, do you want to also maybe give us background probably not psych and possibly a case on scranton cream yes yes i do and i okay. do have a case you do do mm -hmm. you have psych no ha, no i have fun facts about the office though fuck yeah shake your bones oh right here <laughs> oh, i was dancing with it I love it. Okay. Scranton is a part of Lackawanna County in northeastern Pennsylvania. 
Mm-hmm. According to the city of Scranton's website, it was incorporated in 1866. Scranton, what? The Electric City. <laughs> we'll get to the Electric City. <laughs> It was named in honor of George W. and Selden Scranton, who founded the operation that became the Lackawanna Iron and Coal Company in 1840. Were they a couple or were they like brothers or were they father and son? I think they were brothers. So they were a couple. Yes. They were a couple of men. They were a couple of men who might have been brothers. Maybe brothers, maybe lovers. Maybe brother lovers. I'm choosing not to look it up for confirmation one way or the other. <laughs> the land was initially inhabited by the Capoose and uh, Lenape tri- Indian tribes mm-hmm. with white people ruining things in the mid 18th century. As per usual. Mm-hmm. It's what we do. <laughs> right on schedule. <laughs> the area was initially known as Deep Hollow And its permanent white settlement dates back to 1788. Before being named Scranton in 1851, the area was also known as Unionville, Slocum Hollow, Harrison, and my favorite, Scrantonia. (gasps) Okay, bring back Scrantonia. I know. Scranton is just a hideous name. It doesn't sound great. (laughs) Like, it's it's close enough to scrotum. And it's just kind Sounds of Sounds like harsh scraps. Scraps. Scratch. Yeah. Scram. Scrangle. Scramble. Scranton. Scrantonia has uh, an air of... It's very it's very demure. It's very mindful, as the kids it are saying. It is mindful. It's, it's demure. Mindful. And mm-hmm. I like the Scrantonia Strangler. <laughs> oh, God. That the Scrantonia great. Strangler would be so good. So as Amanda mentioned, Scranton is also nicknamed The Electric City. Scranton, what? (laughs) On December 6th, 1880, electric lights were introduced at Dixon Locomotive Works only mere months after Thomas Edison improved the electric light bulb so that it was appropriate for commercial use. So they were one of the early, early cities. Yes. To have electricity. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, So honestly, that... That must have been really cool, but also not because that meant that people had to work later after the sun went down. And yes, I'm still thinking about the trauma that was labor crimes. Yeah, it's for real. The Scranton's steel mills were the second plant to install electric lighting. The first public demonstration of electric lights in the city of Scranton occurred at the Authors Carnival, which opened on April 25th, 1887. During this time, the the city's like streetlights were lit by acetyl ac- acetylene gas lamps, but local architect Arthur Frothingham is credited with promoting electricity use for street lighting. So he's like Arthur Frothingham. He's like they look better, they work better. He was they last frothing longer. at the mouth to update these bulbs. He sure was <laughs> that Arthur. Aside from Scranton, only the neighboring boroughs of Dunmore and Carbondale lit their streets with electric lights. The other boroughs did not install streetlights until electric lamps had become a tried and genuine innovation. So Scranton Mm. really risked it all. (laughs) They laid it all on the line to become the electric city. (laughs) Laid it all on the power line. Oh! (laughs) (laughs) At least I got a little high off of that one disgusting rip, because it would have been such a bummer if I'd put my mouth through that with no effects, but I'm feeling pretty good. And your throat. Ugh. Don't even get me started on the throat. Your buds. Taste buds. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Okay. I love this. It's very sad, but I love it. Oh, God. 30,000 pounds of bananas... Is this the name of a song by Harry, I don't know if it's Chapin or Chapin. Hmm. I'm going to go with Chapin. Okay. He was a singer. Chapin Carpenter. Yeah, something. Um, from his 1974 album called Verities and Balderdash. Oh. Very deep. We don't name albums like we used to. Paul Simon does. Verities and Balderdash. Paul Simon does. But that's it. Basically. Well, so- and he's like old as shit so he's old as shit i'm kind of honestly 
impressed with the longevity of Paul Simon. Like, how are you still alive? I'm impressed with the longevity of Neil Diamond. Uh, and Neil Diamond is still, like, out there doing shows. Is he still? I think so. I think he still does stuff in Vegas. Oh, maybe. But not, I don't like, know if touring. he has a residency. But I, no, I don't think he's touring. But I think you can still see him from time to time in Las Vegas. God bless him. I love I him. know. So the song, 30,000 Pounds of Bananas, is based on a real-life truck accident that happened on March 18th, 1965 in Scranton. Oh, my God. He basically made a song out of, like, one of my favorite gag headlines. Were they bananas? No, well, my favorite one is the truck that spilled, like, thousands of plaster vagina oh, molds. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but there's Those no were a lot so of weird each was one was unique single severed vulvas vulvas <laughs> plaster white vulvas <laughs> littered all over the highway that was piles of vulvas so confusing it was shocking it was. but like you know as long as nobody gets hurt i do love a truck with with odd cargo mm -hmm. like things that don't belong littered all over a highway a lot of bananas, yeah. severed vaginas, <laughs> yeah, to name a few. <laughs> Bacon, beans. Bacon, pigs just roaming. Oh, no. Blocking traffic, becoming feral, more feral by the second. Literally. Literally. Growing tusks. <laughs> Growing tusks. God. Okay, so back to this truck accident. That fateful day... Gene P. Seski lost control of the truck he was driving, hauling 30,000 pounds of bananas, go mm. figure, flying down Musick Street towards central Scranton, unable to stop because the clutch had failed. <gasps> Scary. He was reaching speeds of more than 100 miles an hour before he crashed at the corner of South Irving Avenue and Musick Street. It's hilly up there. I mean, you're like... In, what is it, Pocono, not mm -hmm. Adirondack, I don't think. I don't remember what, like, mountain regions come up through there. But, like, Pennsylvania is gorgeous. It is mountainous and just stunning. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, that's lose, why it was called the Deep Hollow. If you lose control of your vehicle on one of them hills, mm -hmm. you're spilling bananas. Did anyone get hurt in this accident? Or is everyone okay? Oh, Gene died instantly. Oh, shit. Yeah. Gene. The driver. As far as I know, nobody else got hurt. Oh, that's so sad, though. I know. Here's the ironic part. Harry Chapin himself was killed on July 16th, 1981, while he was on his way to play a show in East Meadow, New York. He was on the Long Island Expressway when I thi I didn't have a lot of information about this. I think something went wrong with his vehicle. So he turned on his flashers and he like slowed way down. But he but there were reports that he was kind of like weaving between two lanes. Oh, shit. Um, but he slowed down to like 15 miles an hour on the expressway and he was rear ended by a semi truck no. carrying no groceries. Oh, my. But there were probably bananas in probably there. probably some fucking bananas in there. Is that wild? No fucking. Listen, listen to me. <laughs> shit like this. Simulation theory is fucking real mm -hmm. because like how yeah <laughs> it doesn't make sense i was picturing that scene in city of angels when she gets hit by the car and all the oranges go rolling around or pears or whatever they were i need you to know <laughs> the chokehold that that movie had on me when it came out yes it was meg ryan's hair it was the love story that i want i was like peak goth phase yeah oh yeah I've always loved Dick Cage, like, unironically, and I <laughs> don't care how people feel about that. We have to wrap this up because <laughs> I know what I'm doing tonight. You got an itch that needs to be scratched. I haven't. That just unlocked something in me that's, like, making me emotional. I haven't thought about that movie in so long, and I, have, I must have watched it a hundred times when I was, like, 13. It reminds me of you. <laughs> it made me fall in love with the Goo Goo Dolls. Yes. Uh, leather dusters were yeah. back on the table, finally. Yeah, finally. <sighs> okay. Meg's crazy hair. I uh, loved it. Uh, yeah. Uh, when I was 14, Felicity I basically- could never. 
No. I tried to do a Meg Ryan flippy haircut in beet red. Yeah. Fire engine red. I remember. I've been through it, you guys. Didn't she have curly hair in that movie, though? I think she did, but I never had curly hair, so it was the closest I was going to get. You tried. Didn't work. I did get two perms. Anyway, so here's a quote. (laughs) From Wikipedia, the force of the collision crushed the rear of the car, ruptured the fuel tank and dragged the car several hundred feet on the pavement. Passersby managed to help the unconscious Chapin out of his engulfed 1975 Volkswagen Rabbit. He was choppered out of there, but he died at 105 p.m. from internal bleeding and his widow won 12 million dollars in a wrongful death suit against supermarkets general who owned the truck that hit him wow so good for her did you listen to the song no should we hear a clip of it yes Ooh. okay harry chapin i love it it was just after dark when the truck started down the hill that leads into scranton Oh my god! This is awesome! Woo! Shut the fuck up! <laughs> okay, Harry. Wow! That was awesome! Awesome! I'm putting that on a Spotify playlist right now. I'm literally adding it to my music library right now. (laughs) What a bop! Yeah, I liked that. Okay, I loved that. Thank you so much. Thank you for looking it up. Girl, Didn't even cross my mind. You know I hate music. I know you do. (laughs) Freak. All right, so Scranton is also famous for being home to the fictional Dunder Mifflin, the paper company, people, paper, 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 Dunder Mifflin. paper company from the U.S. Ad- U.S. adaptation of The Office. While much of this series was filmed in California on a set, there were a lot of locations shot outside the Dunder Mifflin office that are real places in Scranton. Mm-hmm. So some of those locations include the Pennsylvania Paper and Supply Company, Mm-hmm. So this is a real business. It is still in business. And while the characters never visit it, it is featured in the opening credits. I drove by it. The little tower. Yeah. It's cute as hell. It is really cute. Scranton's adorable. It's an adorable little city. Ah, I like that. Yeah, it's, it's real cute. Did you know that poor Richard's pub is a real pub? Yep, because I went by there too. I did my own little driving tour. Well, it's inside a bowling alley. Mm-hmm. But maybe there's like an ent- an outdoor entrance. But that's mm-hmm. the South Side Bowl. The pub is a real place that is open seven days a week and is depicted and mentioned frequently throughout the series. It's used as a hangout spot for the characters. How cool is that, too? Like that this business just was picked. Mm-hmm. And then, I mean, it had to have elevated their business as the popularity of that show grew. And like certainly office fans like make pilgrimage there. Yeah. So a lot of these all play- the time. a lot of these places sell if they're like merch. retail spaces, they sell the office merch. That's genius. The marketplace at Steamtown, mm-hmm. formerly known as the Steamtown Mall. Town Mall. So this is where Phyllis got kicked out of for harassing author Sue Grafton. Because you told me not to take no for an answer. And then they kicked me out of the store in front of all of my friends. (laughs) (laughs) You told me not to take no for an answer. (laughs) I literally just watched that episode. I've been watching. They added more super fan episodes. I love watching those. Oh, yeah. The extended cuts on Peacock. Not an ad. I just am depressed and this is the only show I watch. <laughs> <laughs> but also Peacock, get at us. Yeah. <laughs> I watch a lot of TV. A lot of housewives. So while you're at the, the marketplace at Steamtown, you can get your picture taken in front of the Scranton Welcomes You sign that is also featured in the opening credits. Mm-hmm. This was the one I got most excited about. Alfredo's Pizza Cafe is real. Not Pizza by Alfredo. Not to be confused with Pizza (laughs) by Alfredo, which is fictional. Yep. Alfredo's Pizza Cafe 
says, quote, beyond pizza, we serve salads, wraps, burgers, subs, pasta, steaks, seafood, and more. Oh, my God. I should have gone there. What was I thinking? You weren't. I weren't. I weren't. I was still <laughs> reeling from my near death experience at Are You There, God? Is ah. me, Margaret. <laughs> there was a cop outside. I couldn't go in. Still reeling from the dysentery. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so also Scranton City Hall, which gets mm-hmm. a few mentions and appears also in the opening credits of The Office. In 2021, stars Oscar Nunez and Kate Flannery, a.k.a. Oscar and Meredith. Meredith and Oscar, yeah. Virtually presented a Dundee Award to Mayor Paige Cognetti and the city. So the, the specific Dundee was called the best hometown of The Office. Dundee. <laughs> Not busiest, bushiest beaver. <laughs> no. <laughs> Poor Phyllis. So the uh, it, the Dundee is on permanent display at City Hall. <laughs> That's so cute. And apparently John Krasinski shot several scenes from the opening credits because he was he visited Scranton and he was just driving around researching okay. his role and shot some raw footage on his camera. That makes so much sense because you can super tell mm-hmm. that shot the like a lot of the street shots mm-hmm. are from a car with not a nice camera. Yeah, that was those were probably from John Krasinski. Cool. Also, I love this little fun fact. Mary Potis, Potis, director of membership at the Greater Scranton Chamber of Commerce, received a call from Philip Shea, who was the show's prop master. Mm -hmm. So she became his liaison for the city of Scranton, and she advised him on how things should look and even helped Shay get some items for the show. That's awesome. Eventually, Poda Mary created an annual prop drop at the marketplace at Steamtown, so local business owners were invited to bring items with their company's logo for a chance to be featured on the show. This is so fucking cool. So, you know, I really do appreciate how many like community efforts that they that the showrunners actually made. Yeah. You know, like on the filing cabinet next to Dwight's desk, there's like that sticker that says like, like Froggy Froggy 105 105 or whatever. It's is that a local radio station? It's a local radio station. (laughs) Isn't that cute? My mind is blown. I I love this. so sweet. I love fun facts about The Office because they're all so genuine. And cute. And adorable. Yeah, it's true. Well, the adorableness is about to vanish because we're going to get into my case. Cool. (laughs) Yay. I'm glad we had fun for two seconds. Just, you know, how much do you really want to know about Scranton? (laughs) I turned it off before we went feral. Thank you. (laughs) Okay, well, I'm ready, I guess. Sniff, be like Jan and just sniff my candle. <laughs> Whatever <laughs> I get stressed out first. or frustrated. I just... Oh my God. Be- okay, I have a new favorite Target candle. Okay. It's called, I think it's called Green Oak and Moss. Ooh. In one of those glass jars? Yeah, it's like a threshold. Uh, yeah. It's a threshold candle. Yeah, threshold. Candle. Green, green. It's either Green Oak and Moss or Green Moss and Oak. Okay. Both kind of make sense. Uh-huh. And it's in a green, uh, like a light green jar. Well, you know, they have very varying jars now, so that you can pick oh. whatever look looks best in your home. Oh, they have like the tin, the glass, mm-hmm. mercury oh. glass, printed Ooh. glass. The Target. The wax on this is white. Mm-hmm. The label that I have is green. Cute. It smells really good. All right. Well, next paycheck, I might be making a target run. Yeah. Let's I make some bad decisions with our money. Highly recommend. Highly recommend that. Highly recommend. Rocket money. Okay. I was just going to say, <laughs> I got to check my rocket money app and see what my candle budget is, my target budget for this month. <laughs> it's like, uh, you don't have one. Please stop. Shad was looking for something in my cabinets the other day, and he happened across my candle cupboard. Oops, all candles. Oops, all candles. And he was like, holy (laughs) shit. (laughs) You have a lot of candles. I run through them. You do. And you rotate them out. And you're very good about like seasonal selections. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Listen. It's almost fall candle season. Yeah. Baby. Mm Mm-hmm. 
Okay, so before I start this case, I want to give a fair warning that we were only able to find exactly one source on this story. Okay. But that one source is a compilation of information from a bunch of primary sources, a.k.a. newspapers of the time. Mm -hmm. So somebody just went through newspapers.com and pulled a bunch put of information, the story. put it into big, one big cohesive post. Got it. But it, So just fair warning. Mm -hmm. We're going to go back to 1904. Oh, shit. All right. Mary Warner was a German-born immigrant who worked as a janitress at the Ooh. Lackawanna County Courthouse. She cleaned offices in the evening. Mm -hmm. She lived with her husband, Jacob, and their young son, Floyd Wilhelm Warner. Okay. Warner. Warner. Very German. Mm -hmm. In the... It, like the rear of a home or possibly the basement of like someone else's home. So they were like subletting. Yep. They didn't have a ton of money. Mm -hmm. In 1904, Mary and Jacob had been married for around 12 years and their son mm -hmm. was about seven years old. Mm -hmm. I will note here that there was a 19 year age gap between Mary and Jacob. Okay, Mary and Jacob. Mm -hmm. And that if it works for you and you're safe. And weren't groomed? Good for you. Well. Oh, God. And that they had suffered through one miscarriage before having Floyd. Oh. At the turn of the 20th century, Lackawanna County and Scranton in particular were very dangerous places to live. Hmm. And there had been multiple reports of murders and violence in the area in the year of 1904. And we'll, mm -hmm. we'll get to it. But this is, we're at the evening of November 26th. Mary was on her way home from work. It was initially believed that Mary left her job around 9 p.m. and took a streetcar that dropped her off near Bannister's Bakery around 9.30 p.m. Mm -hmm. There, she was thought to have stopped by the bakery where she picked up two loaves of bread and a Dutch cake for her family. Yum. Aww. Her home was only half a mile from there, so she was just walking from there. Mm -hmm. And when she was just... Three blocks away from her house, she was attacked and clubbed to death. Oh, my God. And what time of day was this? This was at like 10 o'clock at night. Yikes. Mm -hmm. Three blocks from her home. Oh, that's awful. It's all awful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Her body was not discovered until the next afternoon. What the fuck? When two men, possibly boys, it wasn't clear, named William Jackson and Alfred Hunt, were returning home from a nearby baseball field. Her mm. body was found in a vacant lot at the corner of Foster Street and Albright Avenue in an area that was then called the Diamond Flats. Okay. Pretty gross neighborhood for being called the Diamond Flats. Yeah. Curiously, she was positioned in this open area where anyone passing by could have seen her. She was just mm. 15 feet away from the road and like about that distance like away from two different homes wow. where people were like on the porch the next day. Oh, it's like God, nobody I just didn't see saw her. Oh, oh, that's so creepy. I think that the, that morning there was like a dusting of snow. Okay. So maybe she was covered she, a little bit. I think she was just like covered and it was like just enough that nobody looked twice at it. She, yeah. She blended in. Poor thing. The baked goods were found strewn nearby. No. Police wondered why it took so long for anyone to discover her body. Even her husband had passed by that lot twice that day while he was attempting to look for his wife. And didn't see her. And did not see her. When detectives mm. stood across the street, they stated that they were able to see the body in plain view from the nearby homes. Hmm. But then again, like, maybe the snow had melted by then? Maybe. The coroner believed that it was a single violent blow to the left side of Mary's head that killed her. Her wounds were so substantial that he ruled it an instant death. Second instant death of my of my segment. Yeah, what the hell? It was believed that the actual crime happened near the vacant lot and then her body was dragged to the area where she was found. It was also thought that she was molested after she was murdered, but this wasn't explicitly stated in the papers just because of the culture of the day. So yeah. we don't know for sure mm -hmm. if that was true. With little information to work with, the city of Scranton put up a $500 reward for information leading to Mary's killer. 
And today that would be just north of 17 grand. Yeah, that's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. People argue that this tragedy could have been prevented if the city council had adequately funded the police. Mm. Mm. One article that I read said that there was something like 40 police officers for 20 square miles of city. Yeah, but how densely populated, like the miles and how many people actually live there are two different things. I think there were 102,000 people there. I have it so, later, but yeah. Yeah, so Pete, I mean, I understand that sentiment and also like unless a cop was right there at the time that the attacker stumbled upon this woman, mm -hmm. the existence of police does not prevent crime. I think this is just like the public outcry. It's a, a hindsight percent. reaction. And I completely understand mm -hmm. that. I completely understand that. So soon after her body was found, investigators were quickly able, able to identify the murder weapon as an oak club that was found near some railroad tracks and had bloody fingerprints on the handle. It was... Ugh oak club it was described as about three inches in diameter at the top and about two inches at the bottom so it was like you know club shaped yeah like a little bat like a little bat mm -hmm. the oak club was later identified as a cant hook which is a tool used in mines to handle heavy timber and logs i have a picture of a cant hook okay good because it's a, I can't wait to hook at the can't hook because I have <laughs> no idea what you're talking about. It's a about. really brutal looking. It's like a stick with a Ooh. with a hook on the end. It looks like one of those retractable. What are those called? A nifty nabber. No, there. It's a weapon, and it like oh, like a, a police baton. Yeah, kind of. I mean, it looks like that meets a drumstick, but it at the it looks like where you grip it has a creepy hook on it. So the creepy, creepy hook is hook. the opposite end of where you grip it, and you can use that hook to like swing and hook into heavy logs and like. But I thought move it said it can't hook. Okay, <laughs> can't hook. Just saying, can't hook. It can't hook. Don't be such a can't. I'm so sorry. <laughs> So the lower part of the club where usually there was that hook had been sawn off. So it Ugh. was just the wooden part. Okay. Investigators also found a bloody handkerchief near the tracks. Got it. The more investigators looked into Mary's life, the clearer it became that the Warners did not have such a happy marriage. Uh-oh. Jacob, like I said, was much older and in poor health. The two often fought about money. Jacob was described as too frail and ill to hold a job. And when he was healthy, he was like jumping around from job to job. He, he wasn't mm -hmm. keeping any kind of stable work. Mm -hmm. Mary would do laundry for money and had just started working at the courthouse as the janitress. Mm -hmm. Lackawanna County stepped up and offered $2,000 for any information that could lead to a conviction. So. Damn. That would be around seven, more than $70,000 in today's money. So that's a yeah, lot. That's a lot of money. I think that the, that the county was feeling pressure to be like, she was one of your employees. Mm -hmm. The cops are only offering this much. Yeah, step up. They stepped up. It was believed that this large sum of money would entice reputable detective agencies to take on the case or send someone to investigate it. Mm. Many leads followed after the announcement of this second award. Yeah, you don't say. It was reported that a man was arguing with Mary in her home before the murder. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Bloom, a friend of Mary's, reported that Mary had told her of the incident. So this would have been like days before. Okay. So Mary had told Mrs. Bloom that... So she was in a verbal argument with a man, but refused to share his name. Mm. So it could have been her husband, but we don't know. Yep. Mm. She also added that she and Mary went downtown afterward to meet with a railroader named Ed. It was reported that Ed and Mary had an intimate relationship and that he could have been connected with her murder. Uh oh. So she was yelling at someone. She wouldn't tell her friend who it was. I didn't get the sense that it. I feel like her friend would have known if it was Jacob. If it was her husband, yeah. But it could have been Ed, mm -hmm. and it could have been 
someone else who we'll get to. Another man named John Garrity told police that he was walking home Saturday evening, the night of Mary's murder. Mm -hmm. He saw a man in a long trench coat with the collar up and a hat covering his eyes. Oh, I don't trust that. Fishy as fuck. Yeah, pop collar, Mm, Mm -hmm. red flag. Mm -hmm. He also said he saw a woman matching Mary's description following behind this man carrying a couple of packages. Which would... Yeah, which would be consistent with what errand she was running. Yep. Okay. So Garrity said he he kept checking in to see if the woman was like, okay. It's, like he was following at a distance? The woman was behind the this, this suspicious man. Okay. And Garrity was like, I think like maybe across the street. I don't know which direction he was going, but he kept like turning to make sure that she didn't look. have like a weird encounter with this creepy man. Okay. Eventually, the woman passed the mystery man and turned onto like a side street that led to a bridge to cr- that crossed the river. Okay. And it was on the other side of this river where her body was found and also where there was like, I don't think I saved the map, but like you can see there are there's a grid of city blocks on the, mm-hmm. the first side of the river. And then on the other side, it looks like just like railroad yards or something okay like it's a stretch of not much there okay and not many street lights for being the electric mm. city oh uh, not living up to your name scranton Mm-mm. so he told himself that it was a quote lonesome way to go because he knew that it was like dark and weird over there yeah and when he got home he shared this story with his wife the next day, when word of the murder spread around, Garrity couldn't help but think that was Mary, whom he had seen the night before. Oh, God. Based on Garrity's account, it was believed that Mary was walking home from walking home from her job when her assailant saw her and started following her. Mm-hmm. It was also determined that Mary went to not Bannister's Bakery, but Turnbull's Bakery, just a different okay. bakery. So they were just tracing wh- the route that she took home, basically. Sure. So, oh, she had bread, but it wasn't from Bannister's. It was from Turnbull. So she must have been over here. Mm -hmm. From there, she crossed the Lackawanna River via the DL&W train tracks and started walking home. The man it's not even a pedestrian bridge. Like, she crossed a railroad bridge. Correct. But I don't know if in 1904 that's kind of the same thing. No, probably. Yeah. But it was a railroad track bridge. Mm -hmm. So the man followed her and attacked her in an area of town that was notoriously dark and had no street lamps. It was presumed that Mary lay dead at the corner where she was initially attacked for quite some time, given the amount of blood that was left at at that scene. Oh, and he came back. Police believe the attacker struck her and then hid until he knew no one had heard the attack. And once the coast was clear, he dragged her lifeless body across the street and into the field where he further assaulted her. (gasps) The man then took off towards the railroad tracks to escape, ditching the club and the handkerchief. Oh, no. Yeah, isn't that gross? Oh, it's so gross. What a lonesome way to go indeed. Oh, that's so creepy. Just two days after Mary was found, her paramour, Ed, turned himself in. Mm. Edward Jones, a former railroad brakeman, felt he needed to turn himself in to clear his name. Great logic, bestie. So wait, he turned himself in as in admitted to the crime? No, he went in to say we had an affair, but I didn't kill her. The latter. Got it. Okay. He just went into the police department to clear his name. To to part to cooperate Mm -hmm. with police. Because I think at that point the papers had published that it, she had a lover named mm-hmm. Ed who was a railroad man. And he was like, oh, yeah, so fuck, he was going to get found me. out. Yeah, yeah. Immediately. People are going to know. Yeah. Um, he told police that he and Mary had been friends for over two years. Mm-hmm. Ed said he was out on Friday afternoon with Mary and Mrs. Bloom, as Mrs. Bloom had stated. So this is the afternoon before before she murder. was killed. Mm -hmm. The three had drinks before Mary left for work and Mrs. Bloom returned home. Ed stayed out and visited other taverns in town. And later he met up with Mary after work and walked her back home. So this was Friday night. Mm -hmm. And then they made plans to meet up again on Monday. 
Ed said he was not guilty, but he added that while at the saloon on Friday night, Mary had told him and Mrs. Bloom about her argument at the house earlier that day. Mm -hmm. So it was not the argument was not with Ed. Not with Ed. And she still wasn't telling them who that person was. Yes. Interesting. So in his initial interview with investigators, husband Jacob told police about an, a man named Caffrey who had been at the house several times. The man had fixed some plumbing for the family, but Jacob believed that he and Mary were also seeing each other. Hmm. Jacob was jealous and friends told police that he would often confront Mary about her friendships with other men. Uh -huh. So it sounds like Mary had male friends. Uh -huh. Her husband was jealous whether uh -huh. or not she was sleeping with them. Yeah. Well, and whether or not the friendships were appropriate kind of doesn't matter because none of that is a justifiable reason for homicide. But it, <laughs> obviously her husband felt some type of way about it. Yes. Her mm -hmm. husband. Yes. So we also have to wonder if Jacob was just throwing this Caffrey dude under the bus to get the attention off of himself to be like, oh, my wife flirts with so many men. It could have been any of them. Yep. Yep. But if he's as like weak, quote unquote, frail, quote unquote, I'm feeling the ableism in some of this. But as they say, mm -hmm. is he capable of taking her out in one massive strike, one blow? And then dragging her mm -hmm. well, to a field. So there are reasons to think that Jacob just had a massive drinking problem. Okay. So maybe him being, quote, frail and weak was and moving around from jobs just meant that he was drinking a lot. Mm -hmm. Because, again, of a all of these sources are from newspapers. And so the, yeah, language, the whatever. language that they use isn't always uh, very literal. Mm -hmm. So that this that's all we know. So jealousy became the suggested motive for Mary's murder, yet detectives couldn't decide if it was Jacob's jealousy of his wife's interactions with other men or if it was one of her supposed lovers and their jealousy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Further questioning in the suspect interviews revealed that the man Mary could have been arguing with on Friday afternoon was a, quote, rag peddler. Okay. Police brought Caffrey in for questioning based on Jacob's statements. Caffrey told police he would frequently see the peddler at the Warner home. So we have Ed, the bo mm -hmm. the boyfriend, the paramour. Yep. We have With Caffrey. Caffrey, who's the plumber. And then we have an unnamed rag peddler. Okay. We the cast of characters is Yeah, we don't know long. who she was arguing with in the home. Okay. Caffrey said he would see, frequently see the peddler at the Warner home. Caffrey also denied in any involvement in Mary's murder. He admitted he had been in the Warner home, but it was just to repair some water pipes, like Jacob said. Mm -hmm. As for an alibi, he claimed he was out Saturday night in downtown Scranton, probably at poor Richard's. Probably. Oh, primarily at the Valley House Tavern. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> Same thing. And arrived home at about 1.45 a.m. on Sunday. He named uh -huh. the people he was out with that evening to, like, cement his alibi. Alibi, yeah. So Caffrey was let go, and Jacob was brought in for another round of questioning because the cops were like, this all kind of comes back to you, dude. Yeah, especially if you are pointing the finger at all of these different men that you're accusing your wife of sleeping with. Like, that's starting to look sus. Yes. Mm -hmm. So when Jacob was questioned again, he told investigators that he often saw Mary with other men. He didn't like it, but he didn't see too much of a cause for concern. Like, he didn't like it, but he wasn't, like, obviously enraged while he was telling them about it. Sure. He claimed that he and his son went to sleep around 8 p.m. that evening while Mary was still at work. At about midnight, Floyd woke up crying for his mother, but Jacob oh. told him to just go back to sleep. And when they woke up at 5 a.m. and Mary still was not there, Jacob became concerned. So together, Jacob and their seven-year-old son oh, went to the courthouse to look for her. They were told that she left there around 9 p.m. the night before. This concerned Jacob even more, and they retraced what they thought would be the route that Mary had taken to go home. home. But they might not have known she stopped for bread or, like, anything else that she did. That Yeah, so they, didn't, they probably didn't know her exact route because the initial thought was that she stopped at Bannister's Bakery, and turns out she stopped at a different bakery— Mm -hmm. And maybe her route changed a little bit because 
there was that weird man. So maybe yeah, she there's like a weird man. It's dark. Took a detour. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? The father and son passed between passed within a few feet of Mary's body, which I mentioned was l- slightly covered in snow from an early morning snowfall, but apparently did not see her. Mm. Police also questioned Floyd, who again is seven. Oh, God. Come on. He essentially told police the same things his father had told them. Around this time, another person piqued the interest of investigators, but they remained quiet about who that potential suspect was. I want to believe that the only reason they were questioning Floyd at all was to confirm or, like, try to corroborate the dad's whereabouts. Yeah. I mean... And his story, and not in an accusatory way against this well, seven-year-old whose mother has just been brutally fucking murdered. We'll get We'll get to it. Great. During this time, an analysis performed on the handkerchief determined not only that that it was human blood on the handkerchief, but after confirming that the Warners had no similar items, that it was the killer's handkerchief with Mary's blood on it. Wow. Okay. There are a couple of things that contributed to the cops super botching this investigation. Uh For one, when Mary's body was discovered... Looky Lose just came out of the fucking woodwork from all over to come see the scene. I think because the papers were like, she was right there. You know, people want to see it. Anyone could have seen her. Mm -hmm. And then that's going to fuck up the crime scene with all these people coming through. Mm -hmm. With some accounts saying that there were thousands of Looky Lose. Oh, my God. Thousands? Probably over Come like a on. period of time, but still. Yeah, that's wild. Mm-hmm. Get a different hobby, says the true crime podcaster. <laughs> Ooh. 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 Also, because that reward from the county was so fucking high at what would be 70 grand today, mm-hmm. there were amateur sleuths from all over. Mm-hmm. like Trying to get a piece of the pie. Yeah. So that kind of backfired because they were like, oh, we're going to get some reputable government agencies to come in and help us. And it's like, nope, nope. it's Bobby from three towns over that thinks he knows better. Who's starting a podcast in 1904. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he needs that funding. So he better solve this case. <laughs> he does need that funding. It's <laughs> not going well so far. No. So I think that's why we had so many bogus leads and the cops were just wasting their time and resources on them because, again, it was a a small police department. Mm -hmm. And in the end, the papers claimed that the motivation must have been jealousy, which is like kind of victim blamey. Mm -hmm. Like, could we not call it homicidal rage on the part of a man? Right. And just leave whatever Mary chose to do with her own fucking time and free will out of it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. By December 9th, an editorial appeared in the Scranton Republican newspaper. Mm -hmm. In it, the paper urged patience with the investigation. It also brought up the unsolved case of 30-year-old Mary Quinn in West Scranton, who was murdered similarly two years prior. Another Mary. Well, it's 1904. Oh, fair. All right. Still, the newspaper claimed uh, that was that that case was an exception they reiterated their faith in the investigators working on this case. So this was bullshit, though, mm. to say that they weren't related or that, like, these cases were just kind of one offs. They're isolated. Don't worry about it. Yeah. So I found another article with the headline murders now common number of crimes committed in this county has increased with startling rapidity. Oh, dear. It lists all murders committed in Lackawanna County in 1904, which clearly made a stir in a city with just over 102,000 citizens. Yeah. So. Did it say how many? Do you know how many? 16 murders, including Mary Warner. Yeah. And Mary Quinn. A week later, investigators stated that every lead had been investigated and nothing new had surfaced. They believed it was the work of one man, but they didn't have enough evidence to justify arresting anyone. Mm-hmm. On December 28th, just over a month over oh, over a month after the murder, a new piece of information was uncovered. It was learned that the club was used as a baseball bat mm-hmm. by Floyd and his friends just days before Mary's murder. Uh, 
Oh. The club had disappeared from the Penbrook mine on Wednesday before the murder. So they interviewed the, like, the, you know, head guy at this mine. Uh And he was like, oh, yeah, we had that um, cant hook that the hook broke off, but we were still, like, using it. It was still, like, in our, you know, on our property, in our supply pile, whatever. And somebody, like, nicked it, and we haven't seen it since. Someone nicked it on Wednesday. Uh Aha. Yep. It's believed that Floyd found the club under the 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 porch. I uh-huh. I don't know if it was like the porch at his own home or some kind of porch in the area at the of mine. the murder or at the mine. Okay. It's believed that Floyd Floyd found the club Thursday or Friday when he and his friends used it as a baseball bat, probably at that baseball field that was close by. Mm-hmm. When they were finished, Floyd put the club in a trash barrel behind their house. Mm. leaving the soon-to-be murder weapon easily exposed and accessible, especially by someone who lives at that house. Mm -hmm. Even with this new information, the police did not have enough evidence to make an arrest. Months passed with no new information, and with no closure in sight, the community rallied around the widower and his son. They held a raffle to raise money for the family. (laughs) One One of the newspaper articles was like, raffle of sewing machine... For the benefit of the widower, like postponed till Saturday or something. Mm, they were yeah. just, co- they were collecting things to raffle off to just get, get money yeah, for them. Yeah, to help. Which I thought was a very sweet kind of small town thing to do. It is sweet. Um, okay, so they held a raffle to raise money for the family that was down on their luck, but that support was short lived. By May of 1905, neighbors complained. So this is like six, seven ish months later. Na- okay. Neighbors started complaining that Jacob was not properly caring for his son. Mm-hmm. Floyd, who I think was eight around this time, was seen wandering outside by himself from dawn to dusk, often with little to no clothing on. Oh, God. Neighbors would frequently feed him throughout the day. Aww. Before long, the juvenile court intercepted and petitioned to gain control of Floyd and Jacob lost custody of his son. And then returned to per- to petition the court within a few months, and he mm-hmm. was able to take Floyd back, and they moved in with friends in Petersburg. Okay. However, a year later, Floyd, who was now nine years old, was back in the custody of the city, listed as a, quote, neglected child. Floyd became the first child in Lackawanna County to be assigned to a probation officer. Oh, wow. Which I think might have just been like a social worker. Yeah. In February 1907, Jacob petitioned the court again to return Floyd to his care. The court agreed and Floyd returned home to Jacob. But once again, Floyd found himself under the city's custody. By September 1908, Jacob presented himself to the poor board. I guess that's a okay. thing. Yeah. He pe- for like, Im- for like impoverished. Yeah. Like you go before a board resources. and they have to grant you various social services. Okay. So he petitioned to be accepted in the hillside home, also known as the poor farm. And this is where Floyd had been staying because it's like Mm -hmm. orphanage slash homeless shelter. Probably like a work and like work program if it's on a farm. Well, I don't know that it's on a farm. It was like colloquially, colloquially known as the poor farm. Got it. So. But it's like a group home. kind. It's like a group home. So that's where his son had been saying. So he petitioned the poor board, quote unquote, to send him there so that he could be where his son is. Mm -hmm. So the board granted his request and Jacob moved into Hillside Home like the next day. Hmm. So that was in 1908. Uh, On May 19th, 1912, Jacob passed away from cirrhosis of the liver. And that's what led me to think that it was that there was alcohol in his life. Got it. Okay. So at this time, Floyd was 15 years old. And they still have no clue what happened with Mary. No. Wow. Jake, her case has gone cold. Ugh. Jacob's body was crammed into a box with another man's in order to save money on shipping because they were shipped to the Anatomical Society in Philadelphia, where they would be distributed to medical and dental facilities for research. Wow. He might be at the Mutra Museum maybe that is a that is sad yeah that's what happened to a lot of people who are like you know too poor to get buried or were unclaimed you know Mm -hmm. 
Upon his death, one lawyer was quoted as saying, quote, surgeons may ply their knives and seal for the hidden mysteries of the human body, but there is one secret locked up in the breast of that man that no surgical skill will ever find. And it's the secret of what happened to Mary. Isn't that creepy? That's I love that quote. Really creepy. Yeah. By 1920, Floyd was a quote unquote inmate at the Pennsylvania training school for feeble minded children. Oh god. In Middletown, he did not Pennsylvania, just outside take care Philadelphia. Of our mentally ill <sighs> at all. Yeah. Oof. So Floyd was 22 and was said to be quote a progressive lad, contended and a favorite among his companions who like him are wards of the state. Hmm. So he got like good reviews. Oh I think he god. was like he was well liked. I think he was a good boy. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. I don't think he did it. I don't think I do not think that Floyd did it. No, I think it's it's tragic and unfortunate that he unbeknownst to him left what would become the murder weapon in an easily accessible place to be used in an attack on the street. Mm -hmm. That sucks. Mm -hmm. But like he's a kid. He was seven years old at the time. He was seven years old. There's no way that Floyd could have done it. No, and he ditched a stick in a garbage can. Yeah. Like, that's all he's, quote unquote, guilty of. Yeah. And then his life fucking fell apart because probably one of the only stable people he had was brutally murdered at a formative time in his life. Mm-hmm. And instead of, like, getting this kid's support and therapy... He was left with a neglectful father for years. Yeah. And, and taken then became a ward of the state. Several times. Yeah, he went through so much trauma. I feel terrible for this kid. There were also kind of indications, kind of more modern speculations that he was on the autism spectrum, Mm -hmm. which, I mean, whatever possible, whatever his condition was, he got psychologically fucked from this entire situation. He sure did. So Mary's case eventually went cold and her killer was never brought to justice. There were a few instances that brought hope for closure, but no charges ever stuck. So two men, 26-year-old Robert Perry and William Pegram, I don't know his age, were arrested in 1907 and 1914, respectively, under suspicion of Mary's murder because they had committed similar similar crimes nearby. And I think Pegram was arrested for and charged with the other Mary's murder, Mary Quinn. Okay. But later... That also had similar circumstances. Yeah, but they later found out that he didn't commit that crime so he was released from prison for like whenever they established that he it wasn't him okay it is also worth noting that both of these men were black Mm, so easy targets in that certainly i mean certainly still now but like they were probably targeted because of the color of their skin yeah so mary was buried at what was known as the little german cemetery on north washington avenue in scranton where her stillborn son was had been buried in 19, 1894. So she was buried next to her first baby. Yeah. In 1995, the county allegedly reinterred the 300-some bodies from that cemetery and moved them to the Dunmore Cemetery. Mm-hmm. But two years after that, in 1997, construction crews at the former Little German Cemetery dug up a body that had been left behind. Oh, no. And there aren't any, like, real concrete records about which bodies were moved where. So they don't even know? So we're not completely sure that both Mary and her baby... Ever made it. ...are buried together at this new cemetery. Oh, that's really fucking sad. I know. So hopefully they are where they're supposed to be so she can yeah. rest as peacefully as possible. But this lady got fucked. Yeah, she's been through it. Yeah. Oh, God. So that's my Kate. That was the fan picker, by the way. Oh, God. Thanks what a, a lot, weird Denise. Case. I know. Yeah, it was Denise. weird. So weird. And while I am enchanted by the notion that maybe her son did kill her because, like, it's such a like you love a creepy kid. I love a creepy kid. I love the Burke theory, all that stuff. But I don't mm-hmm. think that it was Floyd. I don't think it was either. I don't think it was either. I mean, the most likely culprit is the husband always. But yeah, this also could have been a random attack. Yeah. Yeah. I know. It might not have had anything to do with any of her special friends. The rag peddler. 
Yeah. Leave the rag peddler alone. Yeah. Anyway. What a weird mystery. Weird. Well. And, well, now, if that just, the thing with the reinternment, too, is really frustrating because it's like, if for whatever reason, something new came about or some forensic evidence that could be tested mm-hmm. came about they don't even know exactly where this woman is buried to potentially exhume her and cross-reference any kind of evidence correct like it's just that her being kind of missing in some ways it really just, seems to n- seal that this case will never be solved, in my opinion. And a couple different things about that. It's not just the internment. It's the mm-hmm. newspapers at the time. Like I said, I only found one cohesive mm-hmm. article about this. We're piecing together primary sources from the day, which, mm-hmm. like I said, are often aren't just said in literal terms. Well, right. And there's a lot of like prejudice. And I mean, there still is now yeah. in the media. But yeah, they didn't even want to necessarily name an extramarital affair or a struggle with alcoholism or whether she'd been know. sexually assaulted after her death. Yeah. And then the papers are just kind of running with these like sensational, but like colorfully written stories about it that then draw these massive crowds. Mm hmm. Just doesn't seem like it was well handled on any in any way. This is just like a really clear demonstration of how the truth can slip through so many fucking cracks Mm -hmm. and that media literacy is important, that Mm -hmm. what we do in our job is reliable because Mm -hmm. people could be listening to our stupid shit Mm -hmm. 50 years from now. I don't know why. But, you know, we just it's it's we got to keep things tight, historically speaking, factually speaking, in the media. Yeah, I don't know. It's sad. What is it? If it's 2074 and you're listening to this, get help. I'm sorry. And if Talkspace is still a thing. None of our discount (laughs) codes still work. (laughs) Yeah, see if you can still get that Talkspace discount. Promo code gals, baby. Hopefully uh, that 80 bucks off <laughs> takes inflation into account. Oh, my it's God. It's $600 off your first month. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even want to think about that. Ew. Uh, all right. Well, well done. Thanks. Let's Proud of you. Let's take a quick break and hear a word from our sponsors. Let's do it. At Salt Lake Technical College, we believe embracing positive change at any age leads to growth. Imagine growing into a new high-demand career and transforming your family's financial future for the better. Our programs and certifications focus on skills, ensuring you can kickstart your higher-earning career immediately. We keep tuition affordable and schedules flexible, so learning fits seamlessly into your life. Explore exciting program areas like healthcare, IT, electronics, and more at slcc.edu slash sltech. Salt Lake Tech. Careers that work for you. My brother-in-law died suddenly, and now my sister and her kids have to sell their home. That's why I told my husband we could not put off getting life insurance any longer. An agent offered us a 10-year, $500,000 policy for nearly $50 a month. Then we called SelectQuote. SelectQuote found us identical coverage for only $19 a month, a savings of $369 a year. Whether you need a $500,000 policy or a $5 million policy, Select Quote could save you more than 50% on term life insurance. For your free quote, go to SelectQuote.com. SelectQuote.com. That's SelectQuote.com. Select Quote. We shop, you save. Full details on example policies at SelectQuote.com slash commercials. If you're a parent, like I have recently become, your kids depend on you for everything absolutely everything it's an enormous responsibility but one thing that makes me feel a lot better about caring for my child Mm -hmm. is knowing that i have life insurance in case the unexpected happens Mm -hmm. having term life insurance for myself is so beneficial because i can just rest easier knowing that my child my loved ones can have some financial support if i croak Mm -hmm. and that is where fabric comes in 
Fabric by Gerber Life is term life insurance that you can get done right here, right now. You could be covered right from your couch in under 10 minutes with no health exam required. If you've got kids, and especially if you're young and healthy, the time to lock in low rates is now, baby. Do not wait. Do not wait. It only gets harder the older you get. Even if you have life insurance through your employer, it may not offer enough protection for your family and it may not follow you if you leave your job. Fabric has flexible, high quality policies that fit your family and your budget, like a million dollars in coverage for less than a dollar a day. It's all online and on your schedule. So apply when it's convenient for you. There's absolutely no risk. There's a 30 day money back guarantee. You can cancel any time. Fabric was designed by parents for parents and now they partnered with Gerber Life trusted by millions of families like yours for over 50 years. They have over 1,900 five-star reviews on Trustpilot with a rating of excellent. Fabric has more than life insurance. There's free digital wills, investment accounts to invest for your kid's future, and more. And you can manage it all right from your phone. You know I'm downloading this app immediately. Oh, yeah. Join the thousands of parents who trust Fabric to help protect their family. Apply today in just minutes at meetfabric.com slash gals. That's meetfabric.com slash gals, M-E-E-T fabric.com slash G-A-L-S. Policies issued by Western Southern Life Assurance Company, not available in certain states, prices subject to underwriting and health questions. Okay, well, are you ready for my case? Yes. This crime took place in 2017 at a beloved Scranton area pizza shop, not pizza alfredo's pizza cafe okay and the case was cold for years which is fine for pizza but not fine for crimes Mm -mm. don't like a cold case no but an arrest was finally made just recently in may of 2024 oh shit yep so let's get into it let's talk about the pizza shop the pizza shop is i don't know if i'm pronouncing this right but it's either gigarelli's or gigarelli's pizza Okay. The restaurant was founded in 1920. It was purchased by Robert Barron's father. And Robert Barron is the victim in this case. So his dad. Is this like Barron's Pizza? Red Baron? No. Mm. But like, what worse name could you have than Robert, Robert Barron? <laughs> Robert Barron. I mean, I'm sorry. This guy, the this guy is an innocent victim but like that's a that's a that's quite a name that's, that's a, tough a name, name. yeah so his father bought this pizza place in 1961 but kept the original name kept the recipes they specialize in a pizza style known as old forge style pizza uh typically rectangular on a crispy thick crust it seems to be similar to like a detroit style pizza it's giving rectangle if you live in or around the twin cities oh it's so good if you're not eating at rectangle they have a lynn lake location and a saint paul location like what the fuck are you even doing it's the their pepperoni pizza it's the best I know it sounds pizza i've boring. ever had it's straight up the best pepperoni pizza the crust is like perfect the cheese is like caramelized mm-hmm. onto it and it it has the it's not too thick it's not like deep dish It's still got a nice crunch to it, but it's also doughy. Oh, it's so fucking good. I like, I I can't. So anyway, perfected the pizza. They've really perfected it. The origin of this pizza is believed to be rooted in the Gigarelli, Gigarelli family. Mrs. G would serve her pizza to local coal miners who gathered to play cards at the family's bar back in the 1920s. And I guess like mining, as you mentioned, was a big part of the industry here. Mm -hmm. The family would eventually open a pizza restaurant, and it was this restaurant that Robert Barron's father would purchase in 1961. So suffice it to say, this was a this pizza place is a community staple. Okay. The restaurant was a cash-only business, and it was family-run. So they always had cash on hand. Mm. But this never really made them feel unsafe because Old Forge is an old coal mining town with the height of the population in that area reaching just over 14,000 people, which certainly isn't tiny, and it's, like, in that Lackawanna County, like, greater Scranton area. But, like, the community, especially the the miners that were, like, there to work, it was a tight-knit community. Everybody knew them. They knew everybody. It, it never was a problem that it was, like, oh, yeah, they have cash there. They should be careful. You know what I mean? Yeah. Sorry. Oh, that was a deep one. Ugh. They never felt like they would be targeted. 
No, they never felt like they would be targeted. It was an important fixture of the community. People had grown up with the restaurant. They continued to go there as adults. The Baron family knew everybody. They really honored this like time honored tradition of this pizza shop. And while they aren't part of the Gigarelli family, they wanted it. They still paid homage to them and wanted it to remain a family business. Okay. Robert, whose father bought it, but then he ended up taking over, was well liked in the community. He was often seen behind the counter making pizza. He was warm, welcoming, friendly, and just a really hard worker. Like this guy had multiple jobs. He worked his ass off. So just to give you a rundown of like a typical day for Robert, he would show up at the pizza shop between 6.30 and 6.45 a.m. to meet the dough delivery guy who came like basically every day. So they had fresh pizza dough. Dough livery. Dough livery. 7 a.m. Dough livery is received. Robert would then go pick up his son, Bobby, between like 7.30, 8 o'clock. The pair would, he'd bring him back to the pizza shop. The pair would stretch the dough. Bobby's an adult, but he's he's pretty young. And we'll, we'll get to Bobby. They would stretch the dough, get the restaurant prepped for the day. Then Robert would go take care of other businesses because he was flipping houses on the side. So he'd check on his properties. And he was also taking care of his elderly and like, unwell she was sick and bedridden her his mom okay so every day at the crack of dawn he would like open the pizza shop get the dough pick up his kid have his kid kind of take over getting ready go check on his properties that he's flipping to like make sure contractors could get in etc and then go care for his mom and then go back to the restaurant to work Jesus Christ. in the afternoon <laughs> for like lunch dinner rush oh my god Often while he was out and about, he would go to check in on his other kids before they like moved out of the house. You check in with his wife that he could, yeah, go back to the restaurant, finish getting things prepped, ingredients shopped for if they needed anything, but they'd open the restaurant for the afternoon lunch rush and into dinner. So like this man basically only worked and took care of his family. That's, that's all he did. He did not have leisure time. He was a really hardworking dude. Okay. Am I allowed so, to like him? Yes. Okay. Robert dropped off his son, Bobby, back at home the night of January 25th and then went back to the business after it was closed, probably cleaning up, getting everything ready for the next day. And he also had an apartment above the restaurant that he would stay at so that he could meet early morning deliveries. And there were also reports, though this wasn't highly publicized, probably because they never got divorced and then he was killed but he and his wife maria were allegedly separated at the time and so he was spending more nights in the apartment than he had before and it wasn't uncommon for him not to be sleeping at home what is this like modern times now what year is this 2017 oh okay 2017 when this happened so when they when his dad bought the pizza restaurant it was a family-run business and i believe the gigarelli family had lived upstairs They bought, like, the whole building was part of the business. Mm -hmm. He ran the pizza shop and then would often stay in the apartment upstairs, mostly to just accept really early morning deliveries. But then it was becoming more of a habit. It was a spare apartment for him to go. So he didn't have to sleep with his wife at home. Correct. And I don't know any other details about what was going on in that marriage. From everything I know, like, they did love each other very much. It's possible they were just growing apart. This happens. Their kids are leaving the nest. Um, Their son, Bobby, also had some troublesome history, which can put a lot of strain on a marriage. There's nothing that leads me to believe that, like, anything bad was happening between Robert and Maria. They just, like, possibly were not. We're going through a rough patch. Yeah, that happens. Yep. So he went back to the apartment after and the pizza shop after dropping Bobby off at home on the night of January 25th, 2017. And then the morning of January 26th, he did not greet the dough livery man Uh as per usual. And the guy was just like, Oh, he's, he might be running late. Maybe he has a family emergency. Like I, I know what to do. I'm just going to leave this dough in this spot by the door. He'll come grab it. I'm going to move on with my day. Robert then didn't show up to pick up his son for work, which is part of the routine to go get, you know, he'd Mm -hmm. usually accept the delivery and then get things prepped. Then then go pick up Bobby. Yep. So Bobby's like, "Mm, this is weird. Calls him. He's not answering his cell phone. So Bobby walks to the restaurant because the family home is only a couple blocks away. The restaurant was locked up. 
It looks completely secure, no sign of force entry, but then Bobby sees the dough outside and is like, mm, this is not right. Mm. So it's about 9 a.m. He calls his mom to see if she had seen him because he didn't seem to be at the restaurant and it's locked. I don't think Bobby has keys. She thought that maybe he was at his mother's house checking on her, but when she, so she swings by their, her mother-in-law's house and his car's not there. So she's like, okay, he's not there. Then she went by some of the properties that he had been flipping. Still doesn't see his car. She contacts a realtor that they're working with on selling one of these houses to see if he was maybe at one of the properties that morning, if he had discussed with the realtor that he was planning on visiting any of the properties that day, but the realtor also hadn't heard from him. So like nobody knows where he is. I don't like this. Okay, Bobby does have keys. So Bobby checks out the restaurant. He's making note of things that he felt were out of place. Like there was an Afghan blanket that usually was upstairs in the apartment, but it was down in the like bar area where sometimes Robert would sit and watch TV, but he wouldn't, knowing that he had to like clean up and open up the restaurant the next day, it wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense. He wouldn't leave his stuff from the apartment down in the pizza shop. Yeah. Then, like a scene, honestly, I read this and I was like, this is out of a fucking horror movie. Bobby called his dad's cell phone and it rang from the other room. Like he could oh, hear it in the other no. room. Oh, no. I know. Ooh. Doesn't that just like give you chills? I hate it. I hate it. Hate it. So he followed the sound and discovered the phone was sitting on top of the restaurant's dishwasher. So now he's like, uh, the pizza shop doesn't look quite right. And my dad's phone is here. But where's my dad? Ugh. Maria shows up. She checks the upstairs apartment. She noticed that the bed's comforter is missing, but there is no sign of Robert. Oh, I don't like that. Yeah. Not good when the comforter is missing. No. At this point, Maria... Is panicking. She starts calling hospitals. She calls the police to report Robert missing. The family knows something is off. Mm -hmm. Like, this is not fucking right. All Robert did was take care of his family and work. His wife and kids, his ailing mother, like, the restaurant, the side hustle of flipping houses. Like, they knew that he would never in a million years just walk away from his family willingly. Something bad had to have happened to him and he had just spoken to his daughter Brittany who is one of the older children who had moved out of their home a little while ago she was living in Philadelphia and Robert and Maria her Brittany's mom and dad were going to go visit her that weekend in Philadelphia so like he didn't leave of his own volition some but something happened to him hmm. the family also agreed that money was missing but they couldn't agree as to how much and this is a little bit weird Estimates varied from a few hundred dollars all the way up to $40,000 potentially missing from the business. Like cash? Yeah. And again, the establishment was cash only. They likely had cash on hand in a safe as well as the till. But forty grand does seem like a lot for a mom and pop pizza shop. Like even if you were behind on deposits, that's that's a lot of money. That's in 2017, like your bank account. Yeah, I, I mean, I wish that was my bank account. No, Holy I, mean, shit. I mean, that is a sum of money that you would yeah. have in the fucking bank. <laughs> yeah. So I would venture a guess somewhere in the thousands was missing, but probably not quite that high. But unfortunately, Robert managed the finances and he's missing. So without him, we likely can't get a clear picture of how much cash was actually stolen because I don't think Maria or Bobby really knew how much mm. cash on hand the business had just sitting oh so they were just like i don't know anywhere from this much to this much is gone but there's definitely like the till's empty and i mean maybe they check the safe it's like money is missing i just don't know how much mm -hmm. also missing was robert's car one of the neighbors of the restaurant said that he remembers seeing the car at the restaurant property at about until about midnight on the 25th but after that it was gone and they hadn't seen it return but they hadn't seen anything suspicious Okay. They didn't see Robert leave. They didn't see anybody else. They just like at one point they noticed the car. And then when they went to bed, the car is gone. Okay. Although it was normal for Robert to stay in the upstairs apartment, it wasn't like general knowledge that he was staying there. So that raised some questions about the person that may have like abducted him or killed him. We don't know at this point. Did that mean that this person was close enough to the family to know that he would be there? And wouldn't be expected home. Or, or didn't know that he would be there. Didn't know. And it was like he accidentally 
by surprise, interrupted a robbery. Especially if he's but down there was no in, force the, entry. in the dining room. Mm-hmm. Mm. But there wasn't force entry. So, like, how would a robber have gotten in? Maybe he left it unlocked. Maybe. If he was hanging out there, it's definitely possible. Yeah. Police would investigate the presumed scene of the crime at the restaurant, and they did find spots of blood on the floor and baseboards, as well as spots of blood on that Afghan blanket that had been left in the dining area. It frustrates me so much when there's just little spots of blood. Well, well, they whipped out the luminol. Yeah. Okay. And what, that did would she reveal... light up like a Christmas tree? Oh, yeah. Oh, no. It would reveal that there appeared to be an attempt to clean the blood from the cl- crime scene. And there were household cleaning products like sitting out and... The investigator said that the blue glow of luminol covered the bar, the walls, the bathroom. Like Ooh. there clearly there had been blood everywhere. And some of that luminol is picking up like if it's in, in, in the blood in the bathroom could have been him like or whoever did this cleaning mm-hmm. out rags, things like that. Like it got in the sink and then he tried to like wipe it away. And mm-hmm. it's obviously and then that's not everywhere that to get rid of. Yeah. Jesus. So smear like there might have been some spot spillage on the bar that he tried to clean up, but then it like smeared everywhere. So we oh, still boy. we know there's a good amount of blood there, but it you don't know how much. OK, because it's so just it's been not, wiped around. Yes. So it's not enough to determine like certainly it's enough to determine that a crime took place here, but they couldn't figure out if like Robert could be presumed dead from that evidence at this okay. point. Okay. Pieces of broken glass were found in the bar area and glass, a cigarette butt, a tooth and hair oh. would be found in the restaurant's utility sink. A tooth. Yep. The tooth was oh. determined and the blood were both determined to have belonged to Robert. A tooth. A tooth. So they're like, OK, there was obviously a violent attack. Hair is ripped out. There's a tooth. There was a struggle here. How'd the tooth end up in the sink? during cleanup he mm. scooped all this evidence up yeah i probably thought it's in the utility sink maybe there isn't like a uh catch in the drain probably thought that they could put it down the drain but i'm telling you like they open up the pipes for shit like that yeah. they can find blood that's been put down a sink with water and chemicals run through like you're not right. gonna get you're not gonna get away with it that also you're just not. suggests that there was like more than just blood it was like goo of of viscera yeah it's not great based on all of this evidence police determined that a violent struggle took place inside the restaurant it was hastily cleaned up there would be extensive search efforts made by police friends and family complete strangers in the community everyone who knew robert everyone who knew the restaurant they're all showing up in droves to search for him Divers searched the Lackawanna River. Police would comb security footage from local businesses and ATVs, helicopters, and dogs were all used in the search to find Robert. The investigation, however, would fizzle out. The rumor mill in the community suggested all sorts of possible possible motives, but none of them were supported by enough evidence to lead to any kind of arrest at that time. But there was a little bit of drama to pursue around Robert. Mm. So apparently there was a disgruntled contractor that he had worked with on some of his flip properties. And uh, this contractor like was not holding up their end of the bargain in terms of what they promised to complete on these home projects. I feel like and, it'd be really easy to disgruntle a contractor. Oh my God. Is there anyone easier to disgruntle? Yeah. And Robert sued him and won a $14,000 judgment against oh. him. So they're like, okay, there's some someone who had no enemies in the community, but like maybe this person could have held a grudge against him because of this. But that doesn't seem... Murderable? Th- murder Yeah, worthy. that doesn't seem strong enough. So there was also a woman that Robert had hired to help care for his mother... And he later had to fire her because he found out that she'd been stealing from his vulnerable and elderly mom. Come on. And wrote herself a total of $36,000 in stolen forged checks oh, out of no. his mother's account. Get up. So it's like, okay. Life. That's so this, I know, horrible right? when people do that. Financially motivated crimes, though. It's like, okay, here's two people that might have had a motive mm-hmm. to rob 
the restaurant if they weren't expecting Robert to be there. And then suddenly they're in a situation where it's like, oh, fuck, I got to kill this guy. And they n- know him. So it, mm-hmm. he would have been easy. He would have let sh- them in. Oh, yeah. I was going to say that he they could have easily tracked him. And if he had been going home most nights, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? It definitely seemed to be somebody that they know. Because he let him in. They also, yeah, because there's no sign of force entry. And unless Robert fully left the door unlocked and by some random happenstance, that was the time that a robber came in, mm-hmm. which is possible. Robert, it's it's possible that Robert had interrupted a burglary. Again, it's a cash only business. People knew this in the community because they knew they had to have cash mm-hmm. to go there. It was apparently well known that Robert often had large amounts of cash in the building. It was also rumored that Robert may have had gambling debts. People were kind of going out of control with this one, though, saying, like, maybe it was a mob hit. Yeah. This last one was especially not supported by any evidence, but the small town where everybody knew everybody just, like, wanted answers, and they're all pulling things out of thin air to figure out what the fuck happened to this, like, beloved member of their community. So they're still looking for his car, which hadn't been found yet. He was driving a 2006 Hyundai sedan. He had borrowed it from a friend because he was without a car at the time and was planning to go car shopping when he visited his, visited his daughter that weekend in Philly. The Hyundai would be found days later, so like early Sunday morning on January 29th. It was still in town. It was found on the 100 block of Howard Street near the Lackawanna River and less than a mile from the restaurant. The car was found by a family friend who happened to also be a former police officer. He called it in. And this friend slash former cop had actually been driving around for several nights looking for the vehicle and discovered it around 2 a.m. in this location and called the family. So it's very possible that whoever took the car had still been using it or moving it around in that time because this guy had been looking for it in this little community for days. And then suddenly two days later, he finds it in the middle of the night, just parked on the street on Howard Street. Oh, so it wasn't he? Okay, so he had definitely looked in that spot before. I don't know, but it's not a huge area. So I have to imagine he's probably combing the streets like... And he's probably not the only one doing this. Exactly. Everybody knows what car he he was driving. It wasn't a secret that he had, he had borrowed the car. Like, people are looking for it because they know it's missing. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly there it is. Mm. Little little strange. Robert's body was not inside the car, but there was excessive mud on the car's tires and undercarriage, and a large amount of blood was found in the interior of the car. Oops. The blood would be matched to Robert Barron. Oh. Blood of an unknown origin was also discovered on the steering wheel of the car and later on, like, the driver's side grab handle. So I think, like, that handle above the window to help you, like, get in and out. Yeah, that opens the door. I don't think it's the door handle. I think it's the one up above. above. Mm. But in 2017, both of these little blood samples would be insufficient to establish a DNA profile. It wasn't enough. The blood that was determined to belong to Robert was of a significant amount. So much that Robert was declared dead despite the lack of a body. It was like it, it wasn't survivable. There's no way. Okay, so Local that's witnesses. what they couldn't determine from the luminol. Yep, they couldn't determine that from the scene, but from the car, there was no doubt. That's that's how bad. much blood was in the car. That's horrifying. Yeah. Local witnesses would state that the car had been used and moved multiple times, specifically that they had seen somebody get out of the car that Thursday, the day after Robert was discovered missing. So people did see the car being used and saw someone getting in and out. Mm-hmm. Bobby Barron, their son, stood out as a suspect because he was the last to see his father alive and he had struggled with substance use disorder, which was well known in the community. And he certainly felt that this stain on him had tarnished the investigation into his father's disappearance. And I think he's likely right. There is a big problem with stigmatization of addiction. And though substance use disorder can have extremely dangerous ramifications, especially if you get wrapped up in a bad deal or unpaid debts, like outside of just what it can do to your body. Mm -hmm. It can certainly more high risk, you know, behaviors will often go along with long-term substance use disorder, but it's not always the smoking gun answer that investigators often want to make it. 
And it could be pretty easy to point at someone with a history of abuse and like write this shit off as their fault. And that's kind of what they did with Bobby at first. Um, I'm watching, obviously not right now. I'm on the second episode of that Max show called Taken Together. Oh, I haven't watched that yet. It's so fucking good. Apparently, I went to college with the director. Oh, shit. Mm -hmm. So like good old Iowa. Well, it's about the disappearance of Lyric and Elizabeth from Evansdale, which is just next to Waterloo. Oh, shit. They disappeared in 2012. And then there were like two other sets of young girls who were taken Mm -hmm. also around Iowa around the same time. I think it's Lyric's dad and mom had a substance use disorder. They had both spent Mm -hmm. time in prison for Mm -hmm. like drugs and and, meth in particular so yeah that kind of like fucked up the early days of the investigation and people still Mm -hmm. they still have they still don't know who did it so people still Mm -hmm. think that it could have been unpaid meth debts from the dad or whatever and maybe it was Mm -hmm. but like what frustrates me is that doesn't mean we don't look beyond that possibility Mm mm-hmm So Bobby gave an interview with The Vanished and he said, quote, I have a drug history. The people that we think that are involved in this, I may have had a pass with one of them. So they automatically thought when everything happened, they didn't really do any work. The investigators from the onset of this because they just pinpointed me. They just thought I was the one that did it or I knew what happened. So there was just such a lack of effort. And I don't want to sit here and berate anybody, but it's been very frustrating. I felt totally alone through this whole process. Oh, that's really sad. It's awful. Bobby also admitted giving his mother $5,000 in cash soon after the robbery. Some of that cash even had blood on it. But he would theorize that the blood came from the customers of the restaurant. He would state that since he didn't pay bills, it was saved money that he wanted his mom to hold on to for him because of his drug problems. So he's saying it's like tips and money that he'd been paid in cash for working for the family business. He gave it to his mom to hold on to because he was he'd been sober for several years at that time. And didn't want to hold on to his own cash. He didn't, he, he didn't trust himself with his own cash. Years later, police would even search the safety deposit box where his mom had held this cash. And it would test two of the $100 bills that did have blood on it. It wasn't a lot of blood. There were just, you know, there's so much gross shit on money. Yeah. And they did test the blood. It didn't match anybody involved in the case. So that was a totally, I mean, like, grab, if you have a stack of cash, odds are some of it's got fucking blood on it, whether you can see it or not. <laughs> It's got blood, it's got poop, it's got drugs. Yeah, it's, the cash is filthy. It's fine. It's worse than your phone. Oh my God, it's it's so much worse worse than your phone. It's worse than your bed sheets. Oh God, (laughs) miracle made, please. (laughs) The family believed that the culprit was someone Robert would know and recognize. Had it been a random person, then Robert would have just handed over the cash. They don't think he would have, even if he had interrupted a robbery, they're like, I don't think he would have risked his life. They would, he would have just given him the money. But they theorized that Robert had interrupted the theft by someone that he knew and recognized, which is actually pretty compelling because I feel like that person might be more likely to kill, to cover it up, because they know they'd be connected to it rather than just a totally random person. Yeah. People burglarize establishments all the fucking time at random and absolutely get away with it. Yeah. Like when you're connected to somebody. Try to break in and he's like, oh, hey, Bob, what's up? Yeah. Oh, fuck. Now I have to kill you. Uh-huh. I never really thought about that before, but, like, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. The panic would be higher, I feel like. Totally, yeah. Because they can identify you. Mm-hmm. The family would vehemently deny the possibility that their son Bobby was involved, although Bobby and the family would immediately point to a man named Justin Schubeck, Bobby's friend and drug dealer, as the likely culprit. Mm. And he certainly fit the boxes. So Justin and Bobby, they were close friends. They were brought together by drug use. Justin's drug dealer was a guy named Pat. Justin would get drugs from Pat. Then Bobby would get drugs from Justin. Pat referred to the pair as inseparable and stated that due to the pair hanging out all the time, Justin would certainly know the routine of the restaurant, the location of the cash, you know, and with him being even Bobby's best friend, like he probably knew that, Robert and Maria were separated, that Robert was sleeping at the restaurant apartment. Like, he would have known a lot of this stuff. But does that make it less likely, then, if he knew Bobby was going to be, or Robert was going to be there? Well, he might not have, 
and known that Robert was going to be there, but maybe he like he just knew he knew where everything was mm-hmm. and like had that connection. And maybe he assumed he'd be upstairs and not in the restaurant proper. It's very possible. And Justin was also so Bobby was in recovery, but Justin was not. Okay. And so his judgment is not exactly sharp. Maybe there's not a lot of rationale there. No, and he was in financial trouble. So oh. their friendship did, in the beginning, revolve around drugs, but they would also hang out socially, either at Bobby's apartment or at the restaurant where Robert would give them free pizza and let them hang out. So Robert oh. was, like, sweet to them. Oh, Bobby also admitted to having previously stolen cash from the restaurant safe, and Justin was present and saw how he had done it. So he did it by, he did it by leaving an upstairs window unlocked and then climbed up a ladder and climbed through the second floor window to the safe. So it's possible that there was no sign of forced entry because he could have set this up, too. Like Bobby, not Bobby, but like Justin, you know, I'm over hanging out with Bobby. I'm going to just sneak over into this room and unlock the window so I can get in here. I know how Bobby stole the money. I'm going to do the same thing. Yeah. Police agreed that he was a likely suspect. He was interviewed several times, the first in March of 2017, but nothing came of it as there was no physical evidence that could connect him to the crime. Because remember, the little bit of blood that they collected that they determined wasn't Robert's, the DNA tests were inconclusive. They could not get further DNA profile off of it. Hmm, That's really frustrating. It's very frustrating. And the town rumor mill would notice that unemployed Justin who was known for being, like, broke as a joke, suddenly was flush with cash. Ooh. But the evidence in that regard, apparently, was not compelling enough to charge him with Robert's murder, which actually isn't that shocking, because, again, they'd yet to find Robert's body, and that plays a huge role from an evidence standpoint. They can know he's dead from the blood in the car, but without the body, they don't know time of death. They don't know exactly how, how he, he was died. killed. Yeah. And likely there's a lot of other, especially if there was a struggle, there's probably a lot of DNA evidence on the body itself that they can't collect that could connect them to a a suspect. Yeah. They don't have it. And they still don't have the comforter. And they still don't have the comforter. So the cops are still chipping away at their investigation. So what what we had at this point, May 31st, 2018, they find the DNA on the, the handle, the door handle of the Hyundai, too weak to create a profile. July 5th, 2018, investigators start working on cell tower information that allowed them to track Justin's movement on the night of the murder. Then on October, that that goes on for well over a year. Now it's October 24th of 2019, and another DNA swab from the door handle is collected and able to be matched to Justin Schubach. Ooh, so that did match. Mm Mm-hmm. November 25th, 2020... DNA swab from the steering wheel was able to be matched to Justin Schubach. Okay. March 23rd of 2023. This is taking for fucking ever. I don't know why that wasn't enough to arrest him, but I guess it still wasn't. He's still not even arrested. He's not arrested. He's not arrested yet. I'm wondering if it's because it's like, well... The DNA, his DNA could have gotten in that car in any number of ways because he was good friends with Bobby and like they're all borrowing the car. Who knows? I don't know what the, why they did not press charges against him at this point, but they wanted to get it I, locked up. Yeah, they probably just didn't didn't want to try to put everything on this one tiny piece of DNA, which I also do kind of get. But it's just it's it's devastating how long this took. So March of 2023, detectives mapped out exactly where Justin's movements were that night using cell phone tower information. Things. They had some of this information as early as 2018, but it was incomplete because of, like, technology. And I guess now, with the more advanced technology, they're able to analyze this data in a more concrete way, I suppose. There had apparently been forensic advancement, so the cell phone tower data was able to more specifically pinpoint his location than what they were able to obtain in 2017. That's Mm. the only... That's the only explanation that I could get. 
quote, there were advancements in the forensic analysis and the cell to tower information to give us and law enforcement a better pinpoint location as to where the remains would be. And this is from District Attorney Powell, who is working on this case. So it's 2023. They still haven't found Robert's remains. He's been gone since 2017. Yikes. March 28th, 2023, investigators and cadaver dogs search for and finally discover human remains in the Connell's Patch section of Old Forge. DNA from the remains would confirm that they belonged to Robert Barron. The cause of death was determined by the medical examiner to be blunt force trauma to the head. Yeah, that would cause a lot of blood. Yeah, it would. March 30th of 2023, Justin is finally arrested at his home in Old Forge and charged with one charge of robbery, one charge of burglary, and one charge one charge of abusing a corpse, one charge of theft, and first-degree murder. Wow. And I know that I said at the top that this case had gone cold. That was really just to make a pizza joke. It wasn't really cold, but it was <laughs> significantly stalled. <laughs> That was just to make a pizza joke. That was just to make a pizza co- joke, but it was stalled for years. And I find that pretty fascinating because it, from what we know, it was stalled largely due to technological advancements still being made since 2017, that recently, that would allow for evidentiary analysis that could hold up in court. Like before, they just didn't, they couldn't collect enough or evaluate thoroughly enough to feel like it could hold out in court. Yeah. And like between the multiple passes at DNA testing and the cell phone tower info, even in 2017, we didn't have access to the kind of tech that allow us to pull these tiny scraps of data or DNA usable evidence that we do now. And I just think that's wild that we're still making pretty significant leaps and bounds. I mean, you might one might call it exponential. Yeah, because it's what they ended up charging him on the evidence they ended up charging him on is the same evidence that we've had since they started investigating this. I mean, that's probably why they were holding out because they knew yeah. what was going to be available to them in a few years down the road. It's possible. I think that they do have a pretty good grasp because like forensic people go to conventions and they they mm. hear from like technological pioneers about mm-hmm. like what's coming down the pipeline because mm-hmm. they they technically have the technology, but it takes a long time for it to be like proven and approved for like mm-hmm. actual use in police departments. Right. So right, I can see right. that being a reason why they were like, well, we can't arrest him yet because we need to wait for. It's not strong enough. The evidence that we have yeah. and one, and we know this this tech is coming down the pipeline. So let's just hold off. That does make sense. Mm-hmm. But it's also, I mean, that's devastating for the surviving family members that are like, we know it's him. Yeah. Go get him. He's like, yeah, he could be doing the same fucking thing still. Yeah. And if you're going to make an arrest for something this violent and this awful, you really do want to make sure you're getting it right so that everything will hold up in court. So there's just no chance. not getting out. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So with all of this. They were able to determine the events leading up to Robert's death. A few weeks before Robert disappeared, Justin hit up his drug dealer, Pat, Pat Boyle, and told him he was sick, which from heroin withdrawal, and that he needed drugs. But he also told Pat, I'm unemployed. I don't have any money. So in exchange for drugs, Justin used his grandmother's credit card to pay $200 on Pat's utility bill to trade for heroin. But his grandma caught the charge, was like, uh, no, and put a stop payment on it. But that wasn't until after Pat had already given Justin the drugs. Oh, shit. So the utility bill that Pat thought was paid was now due, and he'd already given Justin $200 worth of heroin. Pat begins to harass Justin to get his money. He's calling him. He's texting him. He's threatening to beat him up. Now Justin's desperate. I mean, the tragic reality of all of this is that Robert died over a over two hundred dollars worth of drugs mm-hmm. it, it's just senseless and sad and also speaks to how devastating substance use disorder can become mm-hmm. and the ripple effect to, to, and the ripple effect to, i mean justin must have felt so desperate to have done something like this and i'm not making excuses for him i'm just seeing how sad it is in, on every fucking level. You can look at all of the all of this, this whole situation and like see the depths of Yeah. 
the tragedy. Yeah. Without giving him a pass. Yeah. So January 24th, Bobby texts Justin just that morning saying he needs drugs. He's, I guess he specifically asked him for crack. They agreed to meet up outside of the restaurant that evening, and Bobby gave Justin $50, and under the pretense of having to go get the drugs, Justin left and never returned. So he stole the 50 bucks, but that's obviously not enough to pay the 200 that he owes Pat. Then the next day is January 25th. That's the last day Robert is seen alive. Bobby's the last one to see him at night when he drops him off So he at home. kind of was killed over 150 bucks. Yeah, Hmm. By all accounts, it was a regular day for Robert. He worked. He checked on some properties that he was flipping, and he returned to the restaurant around 9, 30, 10 p.m. Then he dropped Bobby off at home. This is the 25th. Returned to the restaurant and went up to the apartment to sleep, watch some TV down in the kitchen, whatever. By this time, Justin still owed Pat, and he told Pat that he would have the money later that night, but he had to, quote, do some work first. So at 12.15, now early morning on the 26th, Justin texted Pat to meet up, saying he had the money that he owed, plus he wanted to purchase 11 extra bags. So I've got the $200, and I want another $100 worth of heroin. Okay. When they met up, Justin pulled out a very large wad of cash, and he had more in his pocket. This this was Pat's testimony. His cell phone movements on the 25th and 26th. So throughout this time, Justin's girlfriend, who lives with him at their apartment in town, was texting and calling Justin, wondering where he was, which is like pinging his phone near all of these towers so they could determine that from 9 to 11 p.m. he was at home where he shared an apartment with his girlfriend at 3 Foundry Street. He left home around 11 p.m., 11.28 to 12.12 a.m. He's stationary at the pizza shop. This is during the time that Barron allegedly was killed. So they were able to solidify down to within an hour Mm -hmm. the time of death, which is pretty good. Around 11.25 a.m. behind a UPS store in Old Forge, which is where the drug deal with Boyle would take place, is the next pinpoint that they could find from his cell. Yep, Pat Boyle. Okay. 12.39 to 1.45 a.m., he was stationary back at the pizza shop. Powell said this is when Shuback would have been cleaning up and preparing to dispose of Barron's body. So Powell's one of the investigators. From 2.01 to 2.15 a.m., the car was stationary in the woods near Pagnotti Park. Quote, this is where he dumps the body, Powell said. Around 2 a.m., he texted his girlfriend to tell her not to call or text him because he didn't want his phone to go off where he was, and he would explain when he got home. You fucking idiot. Yeah. Jesus. 2.22 a.m. on Connell Street, where witnesses claim to have seen the Hyundai that morning, the cell phone pings confirmed that it would have been in that, in that spot. 3 to 6.30 a.m., it was stationary at his home on Foundry Street. Justin's living girlfriend would state that he climbed in a window to get home and that he was out of breath as if he'd been running and his shoes were covered in mud, which the car had also been covered in mud. Mm. When asked where he had been, he told her, don't worry about it. (laughs) Always a satisfactory answer from your boyfriend. If you ask your, yep, if you ask your partner a pretty straightforward question. And the response is, don't worry about it. And if it's not February 13th. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Or like the day before your anniversary or whatever. Definitely worry about it. Yeah. And if his shoes are also covered in mud. And he's climbing through a window. Come in the front door. It's not a good surprise. Why are you climbing, climbing through a window into your own house? Why was he climbing through the window? I don't know. Did they have a ring doorbell? Maybe. I I have no idea. Wow. Justin would later claim that he was gone for so long and had gotten so muddy because he was avoiding the cops. And his girlfriend knew that he was using drugs. So I think she just kind of accepted this. Like, I was out with Pat. I got some drugs. Mm -hmm. Took a detour on the way home. He took a detour. I had to hide in the park. You know, like, that's definitely a plausible story. Yeah, especially if... I mean, he's probably fucked up. He probably yeah. took something to deal with the body. For sure. Why wouldn't you? So I sh- would. I fucking would. Yeah. Just bought $100 extra of heroin. You've got it. I probably, if I knew that my partner, you know, partook, was using was using drugs, I probably would accept this, this excuse. If you're living with someone who's that into drugs, there's a good chance that she probably was too. And it's like, okay, no. It's very possible. I don't know really anything about her. She had nothing to do with this. She seemed to cooperate That's good. with the police and give her testimony. And I hope wherever she is, 
that she is doing okay. Yeah. From 6.30 to 8.30 a.m., the car, based on cell phone pings or he, his location, was back at Pagnotti Park where Powell said he was spending more time disposing of Barron's body, like making sure it wouldn't be found. Was it found like buried? I'm not sure. But I mean, it wasn't found for years. So I would imagine and they had to use cadaver dogs and all of this data pinpointing. I imagine it wasn't just lying in the open. He probably did bury it. Or covered it under the comforter. I think if he was buried, he was probably buried wrapped in that comforter. And that's probably why it was missing. I don't know why I'm I think the comforter was used. (laughs) Well, I I don't know the details about the comforter. We don't have an explanation for why the Afghan was laying out. I think the comforter is missing because it was probably used to transport Robert into the car to drag him. And then he was stayed rolled up in it and then was probably buried with it. That would be my guess. Yeah. Logical. Yeah. Yep. So the cell phone pings around 8.30, 9 a.m. indicated that he was moving the car from Connell Street to Howard Street, where it was later found. So he had been using it to go back and forth from crime scene to crime scene for days to deal with this. 8.41 a.m., he's walking to Ari's gas station. Video showing Schubach entering and leaving the store was previously shown to the jury. 9.01 a.m., he returns home at Foundry Street. So those are like the key points over the course of... The crime and the covering of the crime that really implicate Justin, plus the DNA that was in the car. Mm-hmm. You're you're not you're not getting out of this one, bus. Yeah. In the days following Robert's murder, Justin would continue to message Pat for more drugs. Pat eventually refused, saying he wasn't selling due to all the cop activity searching for Robert. But it does indicate that again, Justin's unemployed, and suddenly he seems flush with cash, and he's wanting to buy a lot of drugs from Pat. Another local dealer would say that Justin was also buying from him during that time. So Pat said no, and he went to somebody else. As 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 you would. As you do. At trial, Bobby, under oath, continued to deny any involvement, but he did, did acknowledge a sense of responsibility, saying, quote, we were raised better than this. I brought these people into our lives. That's where I feel a sense of responsibility. Oh. I, I can only imagine how fucked up Bobby, Bobby Jr., must feel Mm -hmm. knowing that his close friend slash drug dealer was the one who killed his dad. I mean, that's yeah, that's beyond. I I, I hope he's okay too. Uh, Yeah. He testified that he had struggled with drugs for the last 15 years, supporting his habit through the restaurant and admitted to stealing smaller amounts, small bills from the register as needed to support his addiction. He had been sober for the last seven years, but had recently relapsed, which is why he had texted Justin for crack the day before. I don't think they'd even really been hanging out that much. Oh. And then they started hanging out again because Bobby relapsed. Mm -hmm. Prosecutors would state that intent on robbing the restaurant was why Schubach showed up, but that he didn't expect Robert to be there. D.A. Powell described what happened next as a, quote, horrific, violent altercation, which left Barron dead in a puddle of blood. Defense would try to point fingers at Bobby Barron, suggesting that his father was finally going to cut Bobby off due to his drug habit. But this would be unsuccessful. And also that was not supported by anyone in the family. Like Robert was feeding Bobby and his like drug dealer friend free pizza in the restaurant. Yeah, the family would know if it had escalated to the point where Robert was going to Cut, cut him, him off. off. I mean, Maria would certainly know. His wife would certainly know. Yeah. And so there was nothing to support that that was the case. Justin would be convicted of first degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison for the murder charge with another seven to 15 years added for the robbery. For the Barron family, they'd been waiting six years, not only for a conviction, but just for Robert's remains to finally be released to them. Oh, God. It's like the remains were found... Not you know, in what, 2023? And then they had to be held for evidence. And so they finally were able to bury him in June of 2024. God, that was like yesterday. Almost seven years later. Yeah. Wow. That was just a couple months ago. Dang. I can't imagine what they went through. They were not giving statements to the media after Schubach's sentencing hearing. But in that hearing... They were able to make victim impact statements. Apparently, they were very powerful and in- intense, understandably so. And then I guess when the media approached them when they left, they were like, nope, we've said everything we need to say. We said it directly to Justin. We just want 
to go be with our families and, and heal from this and like put our dad to rest. So like, please fuck off. Yeah. Put it all behind us. It's just, it's just unimaginably sad. It really is. But yeah, that's my case. Lackawanna County, y'all. Cool. Lackawanna, there's no lack or want of violent crime. Yeah, but at least we've got Harry Chapin. <laughs> We're gonna get sued. It's only a clip. It's fine. It is my new favorite play song. Whole song. Well, thanks for listening, y'all. Thanks, Denise Average. God bless you. I hope you don't get hit by a truck carrying 30,000 Stay away bananas. from bananas. Do not drive. Just don't leave your house. <laughs> Don't leave your house. That's our recommendation pretty much always. Or do leave your house if it's about to get robbed. Yeah, I don't know. Either leave or don't leave your house. Neither one seems like a good option. Go watch City of Angels. Yeah, let's do that. (laughs) Let's. That's the plan. Let's do that. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, lovely listeners, for listening. And we will see you next week. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Wine and Crime. Our cover art is by Danielle Sylvan. Music by Phil Young and Corey Wendell. Editing by Jonathan Camp. Our production manager is Andrea Gardner. For photos and sources, check out our blog at wineandcrimepodcast.com. You can follow us on all the socials at Wine and Crime Pod. If you have questions, answers, or recommendations to share, email us at wineandcrimepodcast at gmail.com. Episodes are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the show, please rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. It is the best way to spread the word. If you'd like to show your support, and get access to all sorts of wine-fueled bonus content, visit our Patreon page. Cheers!